Hi, everybody. My name is Attorney Manny Sir of the Rosin Law Firm. Uh, we're going to be talking today about handling your first DUI. So this is going to be a little bit more than, um, involving DUI. Uh, so we're going to go through several things today. Okay. Um, the first thing we're going to go through are today is the, uh, the initial client interview. So I'll be handling the initial client interview. There's a session two about how to issue and work case pretrial. And then there's the basics of DUI. And finally is the DUI trial experience. So session one, uh, the initial client interview. Um, my name again is attorney Manny Sarah. And today we're going to be talking about the initial client interview. This is something that if you're a public defender, it's likely going to be um, your first meeting with the client or maybe a call with the client. And if you're in private practice, this can be a consultation or strategy session um, or phone call that you're fielding from the client or a loved one that uh, you want to touch base on some certain things that are really going to set the trajectory for your case and your defense. So the client interview, uh, we're going to be going through four different sections of this one. All right, we're going to have information gathering. Uh, this is the key to a great defense. We're going to be providing education. So we want to be uh, experts to our clients and let them know that the law, uh, what the law is in their specific situation, uh, what the court is like, what the judge is like, what their prosecutor is like. Is there a diversion program? We want to come through as an authority. Three is going to be setting expectations. So no guarantees, but um, you really don't want a client thinking this is going to be, you know, something from a few good men or a movie uh, that they may see thinking that we're going to go in there and just, you know, set the courthouse ablaze with great cross-examination and a closing argument on the very first day. And then um, at the last um, section of this session, uh, we're gonna talk about the 10 day DMV rule. It's a bit complicated, it's gonna be a lot to go through, but I will cover the basics as this is something during your initial client interview, consultation, strategy session, phone call, you're gonna wanna touch base with your client on because it's very important. So information gathering, okay? So this is stuff that needs to happen prior to you even meeting with the client. What you're really gonna to wanna to do is get in the practice of getting information prior to the phone call, prior to the consult, prior to the strategy session, because what that means is you're gonna be better prepared. And when you gather information from your client, they're gonna tell you what's really on their mind and pressing. Like when you go to a doctor's office and you have all of these thoughts and concerns and you're speaking to your doctor, and if they're gonna sit there and look at your chart that you filled out while you're talking to them, do you really think that you're getting the doctor's full attention? No, it's rather bothersome. So you want to really give the client the insurance that, hey, I'm here for you. I'm hearing you out. And if you have some of these concerns outlined before they come in, you can go there and have that empathy with the client and really let them know you understand. And so here's an example. Right? A client calls your office and sets a consultation for 3 p.m. the next day. In some form or fashion, I would have a process or procedure or practice that gathers some of the following information, right? The contact information, an emergency contact a brief description of the facts, the previous criminal history. Always try to double check that looking at the clerk or anything that you may have that can run someone's background. Their biggest concern surrounding the incident. Immigration status is huge, okay? The immigration law is always changing. We like to tell clients we're not immigration lawyers. But you're certainly gonna wanna know um, what their status is. And ask if they're currently on probation or pretrial release, because that's, especially if they're on pretrial release, they may, may need permission to come meet with you in the office. Um, so that's get ahead of and maybe have an assistant paralegal yourself reach out. So information gathering, before it gets started, I want everyone at their firm or their office to get in the practice of running a conflict check. So if you get someone who calls into your office and your paralegal or your intake specialist uh, tells you, hey, this person called, they're coming on in, there should be a practice and procedure to run that person through your case management software or something that you have to see whether you have a conflict with that individual. Because the last thing you want to be doing is going in the middle of your strategy session or consult, having to cut it off, and then now even being conflicted off multiple cases. Um, and so you want to let them know, though, once you've done that, do that clear uh, conflict check, that because they're in the process of seeking legal advice, there is an attorney-client privilege that attaches. So then they can be comfortable because another using a doctor analogy is if you go to your doctor and you don't tell your doctor that you're having this pain in the back of your neck, you say, yeah, I feel fine. I feel great. You go and you play some basketball and you get into, you know, a rough foul going up for a dunk or a layup. What's going to happen subsequent to that is that can exacerbate the, the 
the neck pain. And instead of something that could have maybe been treated with physical therapy, now you're in the process of looking at surgery. So if your client isn't honest with you up front, it may really deter his or her defense uh, going forward. And so information gathering is the start of your defense. It starts here. So I like to tell clients that if you've ever played golf, right, a very poor golfer, um, but if you are off by two or three degrees on your swing, you could be hitting the ball way left, hitting it dead straight, or slicing it all the way to the right. And when that happens, it's usually because of the start of the contact. You know, you can blame the wind if you'd like, but uh, or the club, that's my favorite. But when you're actually going through and approaching the ball and how to swing it and where you're aiming, the start of that is, is you know, something that is paramount to establishing the proper trajectory of the case. Think of it also as a rocket, right? If a rocket launches by three degrees to the left or three degrees to the right, then what happens is there's going to be um, a, a rocket landing on Mars that should maybe be have gone to Jupiter. Um, and so we want to make sure that when we start off, we're starting off on the right degree. Information gathering, the defense starts here, right? So set your trajectory, okay? These are things you're going to want to look out for when you're talking to your client. So a lot of the times you're talking with your client, some lawyers sit back and work on other cases or just kind of let them vent. Um, but really, if you're putting your ears out and catching things, you're going to be able to use that much later in your case in deposition and cross-examination at a DMV hearing that are going to bring up defenses that you would not have had if you didn't listen to your client, such as injuries, physical conditions, speech impediments, language barriers, learning disabilities, right? Where were they coming from? Where were they going to? Defense witnesses or exhibits. Much more uh, that you won't get from the state's discovery. So if a client tells you, hey, yeah, I had uh, ACL sur a surgery on my ACL about three years ago. It's never been the same. And in the police report, you read it and you're going over it with, with your client. And it says, hey, he, he asked you, do you have any injuries or illnesses uh, that may affect your ability to perform these exercises? You told him no. Your client can say, yeah, I just totally forgot or I blanked or I was under pressure. And if you have then medical documentation to establish that he was in fact injured, that could be a defense exhibit right there. Right? That's a physical condition that may change the course and trajectory of your defense, meaning that he wasn't able to walk in a straight line or stand on one leg um, because of this previous injury. Same thing with speech impediments, right? Language barriers. Find out if this person was born in this country. It, it, you know, it's not an offensive to ask. You really need to figure out if this person is being judged on a fair basis. In order to do so, you're going to get to know your client best, right? And we're going to go over later in this presentation about what tests your normal faculties the field sobriety exercises, things of that nature. And they're not always fair, right? They're trying to be fair and reasonable and for an objective basis and for, you know, but everyone's so very different. Um, and where they're coming from and where they're going to. I want to know that because where they're coming from, they may have been with friends who know this person, who know your client better than the officer, who can testify or be listed as a defense witness, who can tell the, the jury or the court or whoever it need to be that I know Bobby. Bobby was perfectly fine leaving here. He only had two beers or whatever it may be. Um, and that's strong, right? Because that person's going to know Bobby a lot better than Officer Smith, okay, who just meets him on the side of the road. So these are little things you're going to be wanting to jot down and write down um, because it's really, really going to give you options for a defense. Anyone who just looks at a DUI and says, this is a cookie cutter DUI, whatever, I'll just go through some uh, stop motions and then, you know, go into my, my usual spiel as to how the DUI um, arrest was a whole setup. He was going from A to B as fast as A to Z as fast as possible. That's not really doing a full on defense. And this is how you start that full on defense. Okay, get to know your client. What's their profession, right? We let them know we're not employment lawyers or profession lawyers because we don't know how they're gonna be regulated, uh, what they need to report, what they don't need to report. We don't have their employment contracts, but certainly it's gonna really change um, how your client looks at a DUI. For instance, there's a lot of self-employed handymen, right, or self-employed um, bar owners who don't really mind this DUI on their record. But if you have people that are working in, uh, in Uber, right, if they're if they're Uber is very popular, um, they can have their accounts suspended, right? If they can lose their license. If you have a CDL license, right, that's the next thing I wrote on there, right? Do they drive for a living? Do they have a CDL? That changes everything. We could do a whole presentation on CDL, but definitely Google and look, look that up so you can figure out 
Um, if someone does have a CDL, how to handle that, you can always, at the end of this presentation, there'll be a uh, QR code for you to scan uh, to give me some questions if you have them. Go ahead and feel free to ask me. I'll be happy to answer them. I just can't do everything right now. Uh, ask them, where do they see themselves in 5, 10, 20 years? Because a DUI, if someone's trying to be a doctor or a lawyer, um, can really, really hinder their ability to get admitted to the bar or uh, you know, get their doctor license. Um, these are things that we really want to um, speak with the client about because then you're really going to know, hey, is this client even looking to plea? Can I even accept a plea on his or her behalf? Not on their behalf, but you know what I mean, work that out. Um, and ask them if they have any priors. So what's really important here, since we're talking about first DUI, um, you guys handling a first DUI, you really want to look to see if they have a prior DUI because if it's a second DUI within five years of the previous conviction, remember, this is a second DUI arrest not second DUI, or excuse me, second DUI arrest, yes, within five years of the previous conviction, there's a 10-day minimum jail sentence. So you're really going to want to look at that because you're going to handle that case, not differently, but you're definitely, it's going to be, the stakes are going to be bigger and higher. And it's highly unlikely that um, your client's going to be A-OK -okay and peachy uh, with that 10-day jail sentence because they may be shocked to hear that. Um, and how open do they seem to be about uh, a diversion program, a reckless driving? or a careless driving plea. Um, because you wanna, at the end of the day, what I wanna do and what I wanna give my client is give them an option, right? I'm not saying they have to take this or they should take that. I can give my counsel, but I want them to have options. Imagine if you're sitting in your client's seat, you want them, you want the lawyer to tell you, hey, at the end of the day, I'm gonna say, look, we were able to work out X, Y, and Z, which won't result in a DUI conviction, meaning a reckless driving, a diversion program, or even a careless driving. But it may still result in some conditions of a DUI, like a license suspension or probation. You're going to hear maybe the term of a wet reckless. I mean, it's a reckless driving breakdown, but you're really going to have all the terms and conditions as if it was a DUI, which helps you maybe potentially seal the case off your record and certainly helps with your insurance purposes. But your client may tell you, I'm not interested in any of that. I want to beat this whole thing. And we all have those clients where they say, I'm not taking anything. We're going to court. So you know you need to dig in for that case. Um, and so that's something you definitely want to talk about. And as we talked about uh, asking them if they're a citizen, we let them know we're not immigration lawyers and they should consult one. If you don't have an immigration lawyer, a set of three or four or five that you work with, you should establish a reputation with them uh, so that you can refer some clients um, because your clients are going to want the best advice they can. And it's great to get one of those plea memos where an immigration lawyer may write for you that you can present to the state attorney to say, look, we can't take this. We are legitimately going to have to go to trial but if you amend it to this charge, we could probably work that out. Uh, that really puts the oil on a squeaky wheel. All right. Number two, providing education, right? You want this potential new client, PNC, to walk out of your consult with a feeling that you, have an that you are the authority on DUI law. You want to talk about case issues, and you have an intimate knowledge of the court system. This starts before you even step into the Zoom or the meeting with a potential new client. How does that start? You want to go to the clerk of court. You're going to want to pull as much as you can off the clerk of court's website, see who their judge is, see who their state attorney is. Try to pull the police report. Try to pull the DUI citation. What you're going to want to look at, too, when you're looking through those things is maybe already have some things highlighted or circled. So when you sit down with them or talk to them, it's not like you're doing this on the fly. You can show them, look, I got this right here. I got a stop motion, something right here. that This doesn't sit well with me. Or this looks like a very form uh, DUI probable cause affidavit. And those are things that are going to allow you to, to let the client know that I'm here for you. I'm prepared. I'm ready to fight for you. Okay. So number three is setting expectations. And this one is very, very important. Okay. We all have those clients that come in. And as I started in the beginning, that think that when they um, go into court, there's going to be a jury already waiting, a packed courtroom, a judge who's ready to hear both sides of the of the case. You're going to make your argument. You're going to be dressed in your best suit. You're going to put on this fantastic presentation before the judge. And at the end of the day, they're going to walk out of there, toast champagne, because we beat the case. Little they know, they're only set for an arraignment. Um, and so I want to always tell our clients, hey, listen, the cases of DUI may take six to eight months. It could take three months. It could take 12 months. Also, to go back a slide, to talk about DUI diversion programs, we, uh, our firm, the Rosen Law Firm, practices primarily in South Florida. So in the Tri-County area, there is a diversion program for DUIs, if, the, if you qualify, in Miami-Dade and in Palm Beach County. 
but there is not one as of right now, as of November 30th, 2021, in Broward County. So when you're talking to the client in, in your consult, you don't want them to WebMD themselves and, and use their Google lawyer acumen, right? And say, oh, but I know that there's a diversion program. How come you keep telling me there's not a diversion program? Well, sir, ma'am, in Broward, there isn't. So there's a different trajectory you may have to take on your case than it would be if it were in Miami-Dade or in Palm Beach County. So that, that's part of setting the expectations, right? Depositions. In Broward County, more likely than not, you get to take depositions on misdemeanor DUI cases. Now, other people around the country or maybe even the state here are scratching their head going, oh, really? Um, but it's kind of normal practice for us. We take quite a few depositions and it helps us fight our case. However, in Miami-Dade and Palm Beach and in other parts of the state, you have to file a motion showing good cause. And a lot of time that good cause, even though you really believe it's good cause, the judge is gonna deny it and say, I don't find there's good cause to take those depositions. And then you gotta kind of get creative with the way that you file a motion to suppress, motion to dismiss, or really uh, get a private investigator maybe involved. Those are all things, right? That you wanna tell the client ahead of time so they're not going flying, they think you're flying by the scenes of your pants, right? This is really important to set those expectations as to how this defense is gonna look. You're gonna to wanna to go through the minimum and maximum penalties of a DUI. It's a statutorily based crime. So if you look at the statute, you can see exactly what the minimum and mandatories are. For that first time DUI offender, it could be between six months and 12 months probation, right? Six months driver's license suspension, 12 months driver's license suspension. That's typically what we see coming through, right? $500 fine, $1,000 fine, 50 hours of community service, a DUI school, follow-up treatment, um, you know, 10-day vehicle immobilization. There could be an intoxilizer put on the car if it's an enhanced DUI, right? An enhanced DUI happens really in two ways. One, if you blow above a 0.15 on the breathalyzer, or two, if there's a minor in your vehicle, someone under the age of 18. You're gonna to wanna to explain all these things to your client, and you're likely going to um, teach them so much more than they can find online, or uh, maybe your competition who's not watching this is sitting there going, yeah, I read the police report, we may have a motion, here's how much it costs, um, and uh, we need all of it paid up front, half now, half later. Um, tell you, Let me tell you how great I am, and then here, hire me. That's not the way that this should go. You should be all ears listening to your client so that you can best formulate the defense and then provide them the best education. So when they leave that office, right, whether they sign up with you or they don't, and they compare that to someone else, or if you're um, their public defender and you're telling them all of these things and they go and try to talk to a lawyer, right? Because like, oh, I don't know if I trust the PD. I used to be a public defender. So I don't know if I trust the PD. I'm gonna get myself a real lawyer, right? We've all heard that if you're a PD. Um, and then they go and they talk to these real lawyers and they come back and go, wow, my public defender knew 10 times more than that guy. And maybe you don't, but you're gonna come across that you do because you're eager to listen and share information, okay? It's your client's case, it's not yours. Remember, the state attorney has files. Civil lawyers, eh, they have files. We have clients, we have families, and we have humans in criminal defense. We wanna make sure we treat all of our files as humans, and we let the state attorney know that this is not just a file, this is a human, this is a family, this is a career, this is a future, okay? And all of this is what you wanna tell your client when you're meeting with them so that you, they know that you have their back. And why is that important? Because as we go through the case, or it could take six, eight months, 12 months for these misdemeanors, sometimes they take more, with COVID happening, it you know, clogged up some of the court system. You need to set the expectations because you don't want the call, hey, you told me this was gonna be done super easy and it's been eight months. Um, you know, why hasn't this been finished? Or what's going on with my case? Right? You're gonna to wanna to tell them when you're gonna get discovery. You're gonna to wanna to tell them when we're gonna communicate with the state attorney. You're gonna to wanna to tell them that you know, the arraignment date is a very easy, Kind of form you can uh, waive the arraignment date if you want you can do a waiver of appearance so that they don't have to appear in court you're going to want to go through all the tools you have as a lawyer to make your client's life easier and why does that why is that important because you don't want to end up like one of my favorite indie movies here um 500 days of summer it's a great scene where it talks about setting expe uh, expectations versus reality uh, if you've ever seen the movie it's a really fun movie but uh, this guy he has this girl, he loses this girl, her, name's, her name is Summer. He thinks he's gonna win her back at this party. He thinks it's gonna go fantastically. 
and his expectations did not meet reality. And it's a scene that always sticks with me. So forgive me for my poor choice of film. If you've ever been in that kind of a situation and you're going to have these great expectations, these romantic ideas, and then you get that friendly hand pat hug, side hug instead of a lean in kiss, you go and you think you're going to have this romantic dinner. And next thing you know, you're sitting far apart and the two parties are not meeting and the expectations do not meet reality. It's not a great feeling. So you want to make sure, right, as we talked about before, that you give them a fair and accurate depiction as to what's going on. So letting your clients know that this is not a movie. The suits drama and the real and the rules of evidence don't fly and excuse me, and the rules of evidence don't fly in the real courtroom. So suits, if you ever seen the movie, it was popular back when I was in law school. Uh, not movie, I'm sorry, show. It's something really, really, and I misspelled peak there. I see Nettie pointed that out. I apologize. Uh, my journalism background at the University of Florida would be very, very mad at me. Um, but what you want to do is let them know, right? Let your clients know um, that this is going to take time. This is a marathon. This is not a sprint. Okay. You're going to want to avoid and try to, and feel the, don't feel the need to answer that. What are the percentages of beating my case? Okay. There's times where I've caught myself saying a percentage here or there and then immediately taking it back. Uh, it's better to just say, this is the tip of the iceberg. Okay. This is the very beginning. We're going to file our demand for discovery. Within 15 days of that demand, the state attorney is going to give us all the evidence in their possession that's going to lead towards uh, proving your innocence or your guilt. If we don't get it, we're going to file a motion to compel. We're going to push forward. We're going to get that evidence. We're going to review it together. We're going to set depositions if we can. We're going to file motions and let them know that this is going to be something that's very tactfully done. And you should set that trajectory with them uh, and give them what you're going to do on the case, given some of the circumstances. If you, can, if you don't have that police report, you just let them know that you can base as the best year, because sometimes when they come into me with you, the police report hasn't been uploaded online yet. Uh, and so when you're talking with the clients, you just let them know, we don't have the benefit of reading that report yet, but certainly let me walk you through, given the facts and circumstances that you told me about the incident, how that can play out in my experience in court. And once I get that report, I'll have my staff check daily and I'll send it over to you and we can even talk it over once we get it. Because um, that's really important because uh, their clients come to you think you have everything. Think you have the officer's internal affairs file, right? They're going to think you have all the times he's been beat or he won a case. Your prosecutor, you know, where they went to law school, how many cases they won. You're going to get a lot of that. How many times have you beaten this person? How many times has this person beaten you? Um, do you know the judge, right? Those are all things you're going to have to address. It's just common. They get asked all the time, um, whether you're dealing with a public defender client, a private client, a family member. Um, that's all things that we want to discuss. We also want to talk about when we're going to talk again, right? Once the strategy session, the consult's over, they sign up, or you talk to them at the public defender, you meet them, it's great, you have a little conversation, let them know, set expectations. Hey, we'll reach out to you at the first calendar call. We'll reach out to you when we get that discovery. Let them know when we'll talk. You don't want to just have them leave and go scratching their head. Like, uh, I guess they're going to call me, right? Or you, today is a day, you know, we're after Thanksgiving. A lot of times clients call because they go to Thanksgiving and their aunt or uncle, or their friends ask, hey, what's going on with your case? I don't know. I should really call my lawyer. And the phones light up like a Christmas tree. Christmas is right around the corner. And we get the clients coming in. What's going on with my case? That's something you want to avoid, right? Sometimes you can. It's unavoidable. It's human nature. Um, but you really want to touch base with them. You want to touch your clients as many times as possible in the most professional way possible. Um, and then let's go to the next slide. Here's the 10-day the DMV rule for a first DUI arrest, right? For a second DUI arrest, this is going to be different, but we're talking about, we're doing the basics here, so let's do a, a first DUI arrest. So during the client interview, you should be able to answer the following. Do we do the formal review or do we waive it for a quicker path to a hardship license, right? And so a hardship license is going to allow a client to go to and from work, uh, groceries, religious purposes, child care. Um, those are things that the, that the the hardship license should be able to cover underneath the statute. And you need to know if the client can be without that hardship for a certain amount of time. And I'll go through all of this here. It's going to be really, really meticulous, and I'm going to be able to share with you the slides after. Um, so if you get confused or get lost, it's quite okay. It is a confusing uh, rule. So at the formal review hearing, the Florida Department of High Highway and Safety and Motor Vehicles hearing officer will determine by a preponderance of the evidence presented whether sufficient cause exists to sustain 
amend or invalidate the suspension of the driver's license pursuant to Florida Statute 322.2615. Really important, right? This hearing officer at the DMV is not a judge. It's not a magistrate. Sometimes it's a lawyer, but very rarely it's a lawyer. It's kind of just someone that at the DMV who's been promoted or has gained their position um, because they've done so well or whatever it may be. I don't know what ex excess training they've actually had on that. I don't know that. But really, they're going to be evaluating case law. I, I cite case law in my hearings. And it's really important that you understand and tell your client that the state percentage of winning these is very, very low. And what does it actually entail? Okay. What is that 10 day rule? First things first. We've got some of the greatest dunkers here. We got Michael Jordan, we got Spud Webb, we got Dominique Wilkins, right? We're missing Vince Carter. Uh, once you've been arrested for DUI, okay, you only have 10 days to challenge the administrative suspension of your driver's license. So you've been arrested, you've come into my office, you've got a ticket. That ticket for DUI is going to function as your full blown license. You're not in a hardship yet. For 10 days, it's like you got your license, but your ticket functions as your driver's license. Within that 10 days, you need to make a decision. Do I do a formal review with the DMV and challenge my arrest? Meaning that I'm going to challenge the stop. I'm going to challenge the probable cause. I'm going to challenge the breath. I'm going to challenge the refusal. I'm going to challenge a bunch of facts about the arrest and say that the DMV doesn't have enough evidence to suspend my license. And if you win that hearing, the suspension's gone, totally gone. However, if you lose a hearing, there can be some adverse consequences. So here's the 10 day rule. There's a difference between whether you gave a breath or you refused a breath, okay? If you refuse a breath, there's a 12 month suspension for your first offense. Okay? If you waive that formal review hearing, so you're faced with the, the option to waive or you're, faced with, or you're faced with the option to actually do the hearing. If you waive it, you're eligible for a hardship right away. There's no hard suspension. A hard suspension is no driving whatsoever. There is no hardship. You gotta Uber or Lyft wherever you're going. If you elect to do the hearing, okay, you, if you lose the formal review hearing, then your license is suspended for 90 days without an ability to get a hardship license until those 90 days pass. If you win, then there will be no suspension of your DL. So it's a risk reward. Here's second, right? If you blew a 0.08 or above, it's a six month suspension for your first offense. And if you waive the formal review, you're eligible for a hardship right away. Same as the previous, right? Same as if you refused. However, if you elect to do the hearing and if you lose, it's the same as the other one, but it's a 30 day hard suspension. So what you're really going to understand here is what are the pros and cons if, if you typically lose this? Well, let me tell you guys, let's take a step back. Let's see the forest through the trees. At this formal review, you can subpoena and call the officers and witnesses to uh, give testimony. Sometimes they do it telephonically. Sometimes you go into the DMV office. And what you need to understand, all right, is that the officer, and I'll go to the next slide just so we have it, right? This is to keep in touch with me. Go ahead and scan it. But what you need to understand is this is super important. The DMV hearing is an opportunity to basically get a free deposition because you're going to be able to cross-examine that officer, you're going to be able to question that officer, and there's going to be a transcript made of it. Well, there'll be an audio collected. You can always request the audio and then hire a, um, you know, a court reporting agency to transcribe that audio so you can have a transcript. It's going to be testimony taken under oath, so it's going to be able to be used in court. If you are in a jurisdiction that does not allow for depositions, okay, you can use this for your depo to make your case better to have a transcript to impeach at a motion to suppress or at a trial. I highly advise to do the work and take the, dep and take the DMV hearing or do the DMV hearing if your client is properly advised of the negative consequences and he or she can survive with that hard license suspension. Because it's very rare that you win these hearings. Okay? You can appeal them. But what we, what we want to do as well when we're talking about these DMV hearings is take a step back even further at that initial consult, you're gonna to want to advise your client what he or she should do, but it's very subjective because you need to hear from them as to whether they can maintain their livelihood or get by with that hard suspension. But the clock is ticking, right? There's 10 days to make this decision. And so it's really important that it's covered during your initial consult strategy session or phone call with your client. And if the 10, day is 10 days have passed, there's not really much you can do. You can try to reach out to the DMV. You can try to present a reason why maybe we, something wasn't done. 
but really that 10 days is, is a really hard deadline to get through. So we don't want to pressure sale any client to sign up or need legal services ASAP, but this is actually something that's super important to them, not just for the purposes of their license, but now as we see the forest of the trees, the case itself and the officers. Um, I did have time available here for, a, um, for questions and answers. I don't see any questions at the moment. Um, so I will provide some additional comments if I can go back. So one of the things I really want to talk about is when we're getting to know our clients, all right? If we're going to talk about that second DUI, it's something that we should really strongly talk about. What is the difference between a second DUI within five and a second DUI outside of five years? That 10 days, the second DUI outside of five years of a previous condition, there is no 10 day mandatory jail sentence. OK, so that's something you're really going to want to talk to your client about so they understand that if it's a second outside of the five years, you're not dealing with mandatory jail. Now, there are certain judges and why you got to know your judge that will still give you some serious jail time if you were to lose or try to take a plea on the case. But that's something you need to discuss. Here's another thing. There's a video on our on our uh, on our website. You can look it up on our YouTube website. And it talks about why a reckless driving or a careless driving is a win in a DUI. And what's important about a DUI, right? This is some just background information that you want to share with the client so they know how serious this is. So some people think, yeah, it's just a DUI. Guess what? If you don't beat a DUI and you have to take a plea, there's no withhold of adjudication. And if you guys aren't familiar with what a withhold is and you're watching this, it means that you have not been convicted or adjudicated. Adjudication, conviction, synonyms, same word. If the judge or the state attorney withholds that, you've not been convicted. Guess what? If you have an eligible uh, statute, you can seal that off of your record. However, if that conviction come down, comes down and you resolve that DUI, the statute says it's a mandatory adjudication. So there is no such thing as that withhold of adjudication. So you're really going to want to emphasize to your client that, look, when we're talking reckless driving, it's a win, but I'm giving you options. Remember, we think back about when I said I want to give my client options at the strategy session. I want you to have the option to potentially beat the DUI and seal this off your record while maybe having to do some probation or some driver's license suspension down the road, or we can go to trial. If we're getting a reckless driving, it's likely because there's a good case, maybe a legal issue or factually at court, it's a good issue. Um, but those are all things you're going to want to discuss, as well as you're going to discuss insurance, okay? If you get convicted of DUI, the FR44 insurance, insurance part of me, is very pricey. It's super expensive. Now, you may have the SR22 with the reckless driving, and it may go up with the careless driving the insurance, but it's nowhere near what that big FR44 insurance is with the DUI. Also, when you get into the reckless driving or careless driving conversation with the state attorney, you are able to then move around the parts. Things become negotiable. Those statutorily required conditions of a plea to DUI are no longer quote unquote required. We can move around with them, we can play, right? Things are opened up. And really what I want everyone to understand here is that when we set this up, when we set your case up, we're setting it up for litigation, we're setting it up to fight, okay? I have never ever told the client that I'm not gonna overturn every stone to beat their case. And I'm, hey, let's do three out of the four stones that have been overturned, we don't need to look at that last one. Eh, I kind of know what's under there. No, let's do the work, guys, and let your clients know you're going to do the work for them. Because what's really important is that your strength at trial and your strength in a litigation phase, like at a motion, is going to determine your strength at the negotiating table. Okay, So you're going to build your case as strong as you can. If you make yourself out to be a, you know, a run-of-the-mill regular lawyer who's just kind of going through the motions, the state attorney is just going to think that they have their case in the bag or not think anything special of it. And then you may have to fight the case um, at trial if your client wants to go to trial and you're going to look back and go, wow, I really wish I did some of the work to make this better. But what's really important is if you set up that trajectory and you start talking to your state attorney and you say, hey, look, I've got mitigation, right? I've got, I've got a doctor's um, surgery report from his ACL. Um, I've got uh, a, do a document that he came to this country at you know the age of 15 and English isn't his first language. We've had cases at our firm where clients have said, hey, I, I, I have, I'm vertical. And what they meant to say is I have vertigo, but they were having a really hard time speaking it. And, and with the whole video, it wasn't just one word. Um, it was the whole video was coming across in some Spanglish. 
uh, and it really wasn't really translating well. And the officer just, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and make the arrest. It wasn't until we had to present evidence to the state attorney that our client's first language isn't English. In fact, she's still learning English and taking classes, et cetera, et cetera. Those are things you're going to want to show to the state attorney so it validates your defense. And if you file them as a defense uh, exhibit, something of the nature, it kind of gives the state attorney a little bit of pause, right? It kind of makes them think a little bit. Are we really going forward on this? How am I going to work on this? I'd rather work on the case where the lawyer doesn't really care about his case. That's probably an easier case for me to beat than the one where the lawyer's built it up and is ready to go. It has exhibits. And all of that starts from your initial client interview. And it's kind of crazy to think back on some of the cases we beat here that if we didn't take notes or didn't really give heedance to our client stories from the initial interview, we would never have beaten the case. For instance, we just recently won a motion to suppress uh, where a client told us that he had a dash camera video, right? If you don't collect that dash camera video or don't ask the client if he has a dash camera video, he or she may not even think it's a big deal. We were able to review the video, present it to the state attorney. They still wouldn't break the case down. So we went to a motion and we wanted a motion to suppress involving an improper start. But those are all things, right? Clients have a cell phone videos of things that happen. We had a trial a few years back where a client gave us a video of him trying to record an interaction with the police and they slapped it out of his hand. Now, if we hadn't discussed this with the client and see if we had a video, he or she may have been afraid to share it or just not know better that they should be talking to their lawyer about that. I know it sounds silly, guys, but a lot of people come into the office very nervous and they lose their common sense. Um, so you want to make sure you, you steer that ship and give them some horse blinders and say, look, let's talk about some of the issues. Do you have any video? Do you have any audio? Um, do you have any text messages or um, GPS locations from that night? Those are all things that you really want to try to collect uh, as you're going through your client interview. Um, and so really that's, that's what I have for you guys. Um, I hope I didn't bore you too much. The client interview section is usually not the most exciting. Um, my partners here at the firm are going to do a fantastic job with the rest of this. Um, if you have any questions, I'm going to get it back to that QR code. Um, so you guys can take it. One final thing. <laughs> my wife has never said this to me. If you're listening, honey, I love you. Um, but when you have someone right and they have you ever heard the saying, don't, tell me you love me, show me you love me. If you're able to establish a timeline with your client from the initial interaction, if they are enrolled in DUI school right after they meet with you, they do the follow-up treatment, they start some community service hours, they maybe do an NAAA meeting, right? Even if they may think they don't need it, right? Those are all things that when you talk to the state attorney and you say, oh, my guy's a great guy. He's a, he's a hardworking engineer who's supporting his family. He's trying to start his business. This would crush, crush his dreams or set him back tremendously. Please, can we get this into a reckless driving category? That's me telling the state attorney how great he is. Don't let me tell you. Let me show you. So if you build that timeline out of him or, him or her taking those actions, right? Really getting there, moving the ball on their own without the judge telling them, without the state attorney telling them, right? Let, this, let their client look like the movie star. You can be the director. That's something Adam says a lot, right? It, let us be the director, you're the movie star. We'll help you and tell you where to go. We can't make you do things, but certainly if you set that up, if you set up a timeline on paper that I can show a state attorney, you've taken this seriously. You're not trying to pull a quick one here, we're, we're taking this seriously. Other clients who don't do those things may not be looked at in a light most favorable by the state. So that's another thing that I, that, that I wanted to touch base on here today is make sure that you know the client is going to be the movie star and you're going to be the director. Guys, thank you for your time. I appreciate it very much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mehdi Ross. I'm one of the attorneys here at Ross and Law Firm. And we're going to be discussing today a uh, pretty dry but very, very important uh, how to try a case uh, for a DUI pretrial as well as DUI motions. So for DUIs, uh, the first thing you want to look at is the discovery. And you want to, this is a checklist. Now, by no means is this an exhaustive checklist. Uh, but I'm going to go through some of the things that you want to make sure you have in every DUI before you start. So first is the probable cause affidavits and the narratives. Uh, read them carefully. Keep an eye out for any officers in the narratives that are not listed in the witness list. This happens all the time. The state being the state, uh, they miss things and it's going to be up to you whether you want to point it out. But you will see this often where there will be other officers. Sometimes they list one officer in the witness list and there's actually five officers who were involved. 
Now, sometimes that works to your benefit, sometimes it doesn't, uh, but understand that when the officers are included in the discovery packet, you are technically on notice. So even if, let's say they add a last minute witness, if that witness was mentioned in the discovery packet, then you are deemed on notice, which means it will not be a discovery violation. So you won't be able to get a Richardson hearing for that. Um, so that's a probable cause in the narratives. Additionally, you wanna look at the tickets, okay? And this is very important, especially for the DUI motions, because uh, the tickets will say, there will always be a ticket for a DUI and you need to see who the officer is who wrote that. But additionally, you want to see what ticket was written for the stop, because we're gonna be getting into some stop motions in a minute. And so for example, if let's say, the officer says that they stopped your client for tints that were too dark, then you want to make sure that the ticket is for tints too dark. If they say that your client was weaving, then you want to make sure there's a ticket here for failure to maintain a single lane. Again, if they get for that and the officer alleges that's the reason for the stop, then certainly you can argue that it was a pretextual stop. So you want to make sure you have the tickets in there. Additionally, you want to have the DMV driving record. This is especially important if it's not their first DUI arrest. Manny went into some of that as well. This is very as uh, for several reasons. One, if it's not their first DUI, like if it's a second DUI, you want to see when the first DUI happened because a second DUI within five years has a mandatory 10 day jail requirement. But if it's outside of five years, then there is no mandatory jail. Uh, additionally, for example, if it's a third DUI, a third DUI within 10 years, that is a felony. Third DUI outside of 10 years is a misdemeanor. So you want to look at that DMV driving record carefully. The state should provide it, but if not, you should get it yourself. Um, additionally, you also want to check if they've had a prior refusal because if they previously refused breath and they refused breath on your case, then that now becomes a first degree misdemeanor offense, the refusal. If they've never refused before, then it's not a crime, the refusal. You also want to look if there are any medical reports. That's not always going to be the case. However, in cases where there is a crash, there usually will be medical reports. I've seen this a lot lately, especially where officers are taking people involved in accidents to the hospital for medical clearance before they take them to the jail. Now, what that means is at the hospital, they're going to usually take blood because they're at the hospital and they're getting checked out. And so this is sort of a way for cops to get around any probable cause requirements for blood draws, and they can then go through the hospital and request the medical blood that was taken there. And that's actually done as a subpoena, an intent to issue a subpoena for that. You then ask for a hunter hearing, and I think someone else, one of my partners is going to be discussing hunter hearings later on, but you definitely want to get any medical reports. This will have the conversations that they had with the doctors as well as a doctor's observations. Sometimes these can come in the form of uh, the EMTs. They don't actually take them to the hospital and just look at them on scene. Uh, also, you want to get make sure you have the breath results if there are any. Now, the way the breath result discovery will work is you'll just get a paper that shows, okay, they blew, uh, the, they blew a point one, two. At this time, there will be two samples for this. There have to be two valid breath samples and you will also see the testing first because they have, the machine has to be calibrated. So it has to be within, I believe, a 0 0.02 um, differential, but you do definitely want to depose the breath tech if your client gave breath, as well as you want to get the agency inspection form. This is not something that's normally disclosed in discovery. This is the form that shows you when that machine was last tested. It's supposed to be tested every month and they're supposed to go through all these different runs of samples, okay? Um, now you can get that very easily from the agency inspector. The agency inspector will be listed as a witness. However, again, the agency inspection report is usually not included. 
but the agency inspector will usually email it to you. It's not a problem. Uh, additionally, you want to see if, uh, oh, and for breath results, one of the reasons that the agency inspection form is also very important is because there's two types of intoxilizers that are used. One is portable and one is at a breath alcohol testing center. And recently I had a deposition with an officer who says that he doesn't use the portable intoxilizers because he's had interference with the police radio on them before. So certainly you can use something like that to attack the machine and that there may have been interference and that's why your client may be blue too high. Um, you also want to check if there's any urine or blood and make sure that the person who is going to testify to the urine or blood is listed specifically as an expert. Now, this is something that the state learns the hard way. If they list the person who is going to testify to the urine or blood, if they list them as a regular witness, then technically that is a discovery violation and you should ask for a Richardson hearing because they have to specifically be listed as an expert. This is not just for DUIs, this is for all criminal cases, but for DUIs, if there's urine or blood, someone has to be listed as an expert in order to testify about it. Um, like I said, this is not an exhaustive list because even looking at this, uh, I missed the videos. You definitely want to make sure that you have your videos. In this day and age, as Manny mentioned, videos are very important. Um, there's all sorts of different videos you can have in DUIs. If it's Florida Highway Patrol, they don't wear body cams, but they do have dash cams on all four sides of their vehicle. So you can get sound and video from the dash cams. You also want to check if there are any body cams, they will be listed. The officer will write BWC warn. That means that they had a body cam. Also, you want to see if there are any videos from a breath alcohol treatment facility. Generally, this is more with Broward Sheriff's Office. However, I know some of the other agencies have their own uh, breath testing centers. There is usually a separate video there. It is not going to capture the actual breath. I don't know why they don't have a, a camera in that room, but when they go through implied consent, when they ask them if they want to give breath, they will do it on video at the breath alcohol testing center. Again, not every agency has that. Some have the portable intoxilizers, but you will know if they have that because it'll tell you and you will have a uh, paper from the discovery that's going to be from the breath tech and they're going to list their observations. Uh, they're going to talk about the 20 minute observation that they had as well as any statements that your clients made. And then they will also include the breath test results. So make sure you have that. Also, if your client was in an accident, there should be a crash report. And the crash report is going to become very important for a motion to suppress that we're going to be list that we're going to be discussing later on. Um, and as Manny mentioned before, if you're in Broward, there is no diversion program. So you really have to attack a DUI. You know, if you're in Palm Beach or Dade County, yeah, your first DUI, your client can get into the diversion program and then get the charge changed to a reckless. However, in Broward, if you want a reckless driving charge, which is a win, you have to work for it. They are not just going to give it to you. And one of the ways we do that is by filing DUI motions. They work. They, that is the way to get what you want in Broward County. And I have never seen a DUI that did not have a possible motion to argue. So I don't ever want to hear, oh, it's a, yeah, this is a pretty simple DUI. There's not really any motions. There's always some motion you can argue. So we're going to go through some of them. Again, I could do an entire day's presentation on DUI motions. So this is not going to cover everything, but this is going to provide a roadmap of how you can attack a DUI. Uh, the steps to do that and the big red flags that you want to look for in filing a DUI motion. And to quote Jedi Master Yoda, do or do not, there is no try. File those motions. Oh, I had 
my little picture here. There we go. Traffic stops. Okay. One of the first times that one of the first things you want to look for is the traffic stop. Okay. So this means your client was stopped for speeding or any kind of traffic infraction, right? Now, a police officer must have probable cause to believe a traffic violation has occurred. And I have several cases that I'm going to cite because again, DUI motions, obviously that's a very case heavy portion. Don't worry about writing these down. So you'll have access to this presentation after it's done. Okay, so the main thing to remember with a traffic stop is it's probable cause. It's probable cause and it is an objective standard. Okay, so there is no, oh, I thought he was speeding. If you're saying he was speeding, then did you use a radar and was that machine calibrated? This is not simply a, oh, and I, I eyeballed him and I believe he was speeding. No, traffic infraction has to have probable cause. And as this case cites, the subjective knowledge, motivation, or intention of the individual officer involved is wholly irrelevant. So if the officer thought, I can pull him over because he has a tail light out, right? So I'm gonna pull him over. Wrong, if he has two working tail lights per case law, per the Hilton one and Hilton two cases, then that's not a valid stop. It doesn't matter if the officer thought he could, he was wrong and it is an objective basis. So um, just some typical traffic stops that you're going to see. I, I cite to Heard here. There we go. So this is uh, so you can see this a little better. Now in Heard versus State, and this is a fourth DCA case, so we use that a lot. Um, that is a failure to use a turn signal. And what that case basically said is, although that can be a traffic infraction, if no other traffic was affected by the failure to signal, then it is not a valid stop. So that becomes very important because you are going to see that affecting other traffic is a requirement for some other stops. Uh, so here I cite, I have the failure to maintain a single lane, which is weaving. So that is a classic reason for a stop on a DUI. Also because weaving unlike speeding or having a bad taillight or having your vehicle not registered, weaving is sort of a red flag to a, an officer and a jury that your client might have been um, impaired. So you want to attack that weaving stop and the actual, it's not called weaving, it's called failure to maintain a single lane. So I have some cases here that I cited. And again, you'll have copies. You are going to see a lot of Florida Law Weekly cases cited. That is because whatever circuit you are practicing in, you want to cite from that circuit. It's where your the meat of your case law is going to come in because again, since most DUIs are misdemeanors, when they get appealed, they get appealed to the circuit court. So that's generally where you're going to have all of your legal cases. Um, now you're still going to cite to some other like Heard v. State, which is a fourth DCA case, but generally you wanna to cite to the Florida Law Weekly cases because the judge that you're arguing this in front of, some of them are their cases. So it's great to be able to say, as this court previously ruled, et cetera, et cetera. So make sure you do that. So these here are some cases just on failure to maintain a single lane. And again, that other traffic must be affected. Um, again, these are some more cases that, and some of these are things that when you look at this in your discovery, you might think, oh, I don't have a motion to suppress on this. In this case in Alford, the vehicle went in a weaving pattern six to seven times. But again, if there no other traffic was affected, then it's not a valid traffic stop. So you want to look at if there is body cam, you want to look at the driving pattern if it was captured. If there is a dash cam, you want to look at whether that driving pattern was captured. As Manny said earlier, we had a motion to suppress recently where there was no dash cam, but our client had a dash cam. And that's it. That was the motion to suppress. And we won it because, again, the judge saw that what the officer said happened wasn't correct. And in fact, the, the, it was an improper start was the citation, but in fact, it was a proper start. So boom, that case is gone because if the traffic stop 
is deemed to be unconstitutional, then the entire case gets thrown out. So that's what's called a dispositive motion. Uh, so again, here are some more cases about uh, driving patterns and about failure to maintain a single lane. Okay, so when talking, oh, and, and just uh, some other tra uh, possible traffic stops that you'll see, you are also going to see, uh, I have a case recently where they were driving too slow. And again, one of the arguments that I'm making that I'm going to be making is that no other traffic was affected because in fact, there were other lanes of travel. She was on the left lane, there were other lanes of travel. So in fact, other vehicles were able to go around her, which means that you are not endangering other vehicles. Now, although an officer needs probable cause in order to effectuate a traffic stop, they can stop a vehicle based on the fellow officer rule. And here I cite to Montez Valaton v. State. If you take nothing out of this presentation, just re read that case. It's an excellent case. It's uh, actually a DUI manslaughter case, but it goes into legal blood draws. It goes into fellow officer rule. It's a Florida Supreme Court case that's pretty recent, and it has an excellent analysis of the fellow officer rule. And what it basically says is, yes, you can have probable cause to ask for a blood draw or to conduct a traffic stop from another officer as long as that was directly communicated to you. It can't be assumed. So in Montez Valaton, the officer was asked to request a legal a blood draw from the person. However, they were not specifically told the things that the other officer observed in order to give probable cause, like beer cans were found in the car. And this officer did not specifically know about that because he was not told. And so Montez Valaton said, nope, there is no fellow officer rule unless there's direct communication. So read that case. Uh, I actually got a DUI manslaughter no prost when that case came out because of the legal blood draws. So that is an excellent case uh, for fellow officer rule as well as for blood draws. Also keep in mind, again, not all of this is in slides because there's just so many motions you can do. Uh, if your client is stopped for a traffic stop that turns into a DUI stop, there has to be, there cannot be a, an unreasonable delay. Okay, so keep in mind the time that it takes for the officer to actually start the DUI investigation from the traffic stop, because the law says that you can only keep that person there as long as it takes to write the citation. Okay, you can't just hold them there and wait for a canine. You can't just hold them there and wait for an officer without more. So if there is just a traffic stop, they can't just keep them there and then turn it into a DUI investigation. And also, if you have any questions, go ahead and type them up. I can, I'll get to them at the end. Uh, they're anonymous, so don't worry about anyone else seeing your questions. All right, so that was traffic stops, traffic stops which require a probable cause and they have an objective basis. Then there are investigative stops. Now, investigative stops, unlike traffic stops, do not require probable cause. They only require reasonable suspicion supported by articulable facts that criminal activity may be afoot. Okay, what does that mean? Well, we're going to get to that because as everything, it's up to interpretation. Now, whenever any law enforcement officer encounters a person under these circumstances that's about to commit a violation of the criminal laws of this state, you can temporarily detain that person for the purpose of ascertaining the identity of the person temporarily detained and the circumstances surrounding his presence which led the officer to believe that he had committed, was committing, or was about to commit a criminal offense. So what does that mean? That means that it has to be, you have to be able to articulate it and it has to be a temporary detention. You can't just hold someone indefinitely. It is simply to dispel whatever suspicion they had. This applies to all cases, but for DUIs specifically, dispelling the suspicion can sometimes be 
for, uh, in the form of field sobriety exercises. So that is directly from the Florida statutes. And like I said before, uh, reasonable suspicion, like probable cause, is dependent upon, upon both the content of information possessed by the police and its degree of reliability. Basically, this is a totality of the circumstances because investigative stops, especially unlike probable cause, uh, unlike uh, traffic stops, investigative stops are based on more than one factor. And you will see that a lot when you get the odor of alcohol because odor of alcohol is almost always one of the factors that's cited in DUI cases for the suspicion of DUI. So again, you want to look at the totality of the circumstances because as Manny was saying before, you know, your client might have a speech impediment or might have an accent or medical conditions that affect their balance. So when you want to look at the totality of the circumstances, because if those are the circumstances that were used for the reasonable suspicion, then you can certainly attack those. All right. Now, when you're looking at the reliability factors, you want to look at whether it's an anonymous tip versus a confidential informant. I threw this in here because recently I, I just had a motion to suppress where the the basis of the stop was from a 911 call stating that this vehicle is driving recklessly. So the person gives their name, they give their information to the hotline. They say that this car is weaving all over the road um, and the officer then effectuates a stop based on that call. So can that come in? Yes, if the officer observes a separate driving pattern as well. And the reason I put this in here is because you'll get anonymous tipsters are people who do not leave their name, citizen informants. Um, and again, I'm sorry, this says confidential informants. They are confidential sometimes, but they're citizen informants in that they will give their name to the officer as well as information. Even if that's not necessarily listed in your discovery, uh, a, C, a citizen informant versus an anonymous tipster is considered more reliable because they are giving their information. Anonymous tipsters are considered inherently unreliable because anybody can call and you know report a crime just because they want to mess with someone. So if you don't, if you're not leaving your information, then that is not deemed to be reliable. And it's as if there was no call and the officer has to look at everything in a blank slate versus a citizen informant does give a degree of reliability. So in the case that I had, the state relied on this case, which is Ellis versus state. Uh, and that is that the on duty officer was making an investigatory stop, but the CI, was a an, an off-duty officer. So again, even if that's what happens, then they have to make their own observations. And so more on investigative stops, uh, you are going to see health stops, okay? So that's this case here, and I don't know why I repeated this. I repeated it because it's very important. So basically a legitimate concern for the safety of the motoring public can warrant a brief investigatory stop. And again, brief investigatory stop to determine whether a driver is ill, tired, or driving under the influence in situations less suspicious than that required for other types of criminal behavior. So when are you going to see this? You're gonna see this a lot when someone is sleeping behind the wheel because you know, so they'll, they'll get a call and this is a classic fact pattern of someone is sleeping behind the wheel, either stopped at a red light or sleeping behind the wheel on the side of the road. OK, now, again, you want to determine whether or not this stop was brief enough. So in other words, someone sleeping at the side of the wheel and you're making a stop for to make sure that they're OK. It's a, a, a wellness check. So they knock on the window. And the person immediately rolls down the window and says, oh, sorry, I fell asleep. It's It's been a long day. Uh, I'm fine. Well, technically, that is it. And that should be the end because it's just a brief investigatory stop to determine whether everything's OK. If then additional factors come out, like, well, when they roll down the window, I smell the strong odor of alcohol and, you know, they're 
their eyes were bloodshot and they were slurring their speech. So now this turned from a wellness check into an investigatory stop for a DUI, where at that point, then they're going to say they wanted field sobriety exercises to dispel the suspicion. Um, if your client can't be woken up, which I've seen on a couple of recent cases where there's knocks and knocks and knocks on the window, uh, shaking the car, uh, opening the car door and actually shaking the person, you know, and then the person wakes up and says, oh, I'm sorry, officer, here's my library card when you're asking for my driver's license. Well, that's not a good fact pattern for you. And that is definitely going to turn into a valid stop for a DUI. But again, you always want to keep in mind totality of the circumstances, okay? Don't be discouraged because your client is asleep behind the wheel, then rolls down the window and there's an odor of alcohol because we're going to get into it later, but an odor of alcohol is not enough. There have to be other factors. And the other factors can be attacked. So again, even if it looks bad, you can always find a motion to suppress. Now, one of the other ways to stop, so there's a traffic stop, there is an investigatory stop, and then there is a car crash, okay? You're gonna get a lot of car crashes that turn into DUI investigation, and here the accident report privilege is very important. Okay, so what is the accident report privilege? In Florida, and this is per the statute, in Florida, they want, if you're involved in an accident, the legislature wants you to be open and honest and not be worried about incriminating yourself. So what the legislature says is that we're going to grant immunity to any statements that you're making in the course of a crash investigation. Okay, so that means that when the officers, you know, there is no attacking a stop on a crash investigation because obviously officers are going to come and they're going to investigate what happened, right? It's a crash. Officers are going to be coming. However, when they're speaking to your client and your client starts telling them, you know, the officer says, hey, what happened? Are you OK? And your client starts saying, yeah, you know, I yeah, I, I hit my head on the windshield. Um, I had just come from this bar and had a few drinks. Okay, all of those statements are going to be kept out. Now, you can do this in a motion in limine. You can do this in a motion to suppress. I had a motion to suppress recently. That was a four-part motion to suppress. I only won on the accident report privilege part, but based on that, I got a reckless offer. So we considered that a win. But if there is a crash in your case, you must always, always, always file the accident report privilege motion. All right. And so these are some of the big cases that we cite for accident report privilege. It, it has very specific requirements. So when there is a car crash, what is supposed to happen is that the officer who is investigating the crash is asking questions on the crash. Then another officer comes in and that officer has to say, hi, this crash investigation is now concluded I am now conducting a criminal investigation for a DUI. And then they are supposed to read Miranda. All right now, these are the cases that are mostly cited to. Also, we cite to Vetner. Vetner summarizes this, and this is directly, this quote right here is directly from Vetner. Uh, I recommend you put this in your motion in limine or your motion to suppress, but again, in Vedner, they emphasize that Miranda has to be given. This is very important because there is actually there are actually quite a few Florida Law Weekly cases that say that Miranda is not required as long as you inform them that this is now a criminal investigation. I still argue Miranda is important. I still argue Miranda is a requirement especially because you are going to learn in the depositions that most officers don't think Miranda is a requirement. You ask them when they're when they finish their crash investigation and they're now conducting a criminal investigation, you ask them, okay, at what point did you read Miranda? 
oh, no, I didn't read Miranda because I wasn't asking them any incriminating questions. All right, well, number one, I wholly disagree that you are not asking incriminating questions because if you're asking someone, where did you come from tonight? How many drinks have you had? Those are all incriminating questions as far as a DUI goes. But what you're usually going to see is you are going to see that they say, crash investigation is concluded, criminal investigation has begun. If it's the same officer, it's called changing of the hats. So it can be the same officer who's conducting the crash investigation and then doing the criminal investigation, but they have to very clearly state to your client, I was conducting the crash investigation, that investigation is concluded, and now this is a criminal DUI investigation, followed by Miranda, but again, be prepared for an argument on that. Now, in winning this, this is not a dispositive motion. That's why I said you can put this in a motion in limine if you don't have other motions to suppress, which again, you should, but it only mutes the audio. So just keep in mind that accident report privilege doesn't mean that that entire portion of the video is redacted. All that's gonna be redacted is the audio. And the officer can still testify that during this conversation, they can't say what the conversation was, but they can testify, yeah, during this conversation, they were slurring, they were swaying. The jury is still gonna see if your client has to, you know, lean against the car for support, or if your client has, um, is stumbling over, they're not going to hear them, but they're also going to hear it, but they are going to hear the officer's observations about it. And again, I put in here, keep in mind that you're going to probably have to fight the judge on whether Miranda must be read, but stand your ground. Okay. Now, the next part is field sobriety exercises and emphasis on the exercises. They are not tests. There is a litany of case law that says you cannot call them a test because that has different implications. So, and I, and you know what, you'd be surprised. I still see that sometimes where they call them tests. Uh, so when that happens, you have to address that in a separate motion, but generally uh, for field sobriety exercises, state the Amacrane. An officer may request a driver to participate in field sobriety exercises if they have reasonable suspicion that the driver is operating the vehicle under the influence. This detention cannot occur unless the officer has some objective manifestation that the driver is driving under the influence. And again, I say objective because, that would, one, that's the law, but objective versus subjective, right? You always have to keep that in mind because an objective manifestation is something like bloodshot eyes, slurring. It's something that I can see, that I can see it from the video, okay? And this is going to come, this is going to become very important when we talk about the Wiggins case. Uh, we're going to get to that, but nowadays that video is so readily available you can actually rely on the video instead of the officer's testimony. Uh, but we're, we're gonna get into that. One of the things that you have to remember with, flu, uh, with field sobriety exercises is that in order to request them, again, you have to have that objective manifestation. You have to have a list of factors of impairment. What factors of impairment did you observe that made you think this person was intoxicated? Because when they ask for field sobriety exercises, at that point, they're supposed to be asking this to dispel their suspicion that this person might be intoxicated, okay? They are not supposed to already think that that person or already have probable cause that that person is intoxicated. Um, so let's talk a little bit here about you can't argue command uh, requires probable cause. I threw that in because there is a recent case that came out. It's actually not even in Florida Law Weekly yet because it's still on a mandate. It was here from the 17th Circuit. Um, it's Marcellus. I can send you guys the mandate. But basically, there was uh, one of the things that we would put in DUI motions is if the officer is saying something like, I need you to do field sobriety exercises then we argue, well, that is a command. You're not asking them if they want to perform voluntary exercises. 
you are commanding them to perform the exercises. And the difference is that to command someone to perform the exercises, we used to argue that required probable cause. A case came out recently, Marcellus, that uh, the judge agreed, the judge, the, the lower, the misdemeanor judge, the county court judge said, yes, this is gonna be suppressed because the officer commanded and they didn't have probable cause. And then when it went on appeal to the 17th circuit, they determined that commands don't require probable cause, that we've been misreading the case law. And they cite to this case, State v. Amacrane, that talks about testing, field sobriety exercises, you have to have reasonable suspicion, not probable cause. So that really sucks because obviously probable cause is a much higher standard than reasonable suspicion. However, don't fret because I, we found a way around it and I actually argued that and it was successful. So we're going to get to what you can argue instead of this. And also keep in mind, again, the law is ever changing. Uh, even this right here about commands requiring probable cause and now it, you require reasonable suspicion. That is my understanding is that is up on appeal because there was another circuit that disagreed. So I guess they're going to let the district courts sort that out. But remember, you can still argue that, OK, so let's say the state says, fine, you know what? You can they can command it. They had reasonable suspicion. So they could say, hey, I need you to do these exercises. You know what? It doesn't matter because the exercises are still voluntary. OK, and so sure you may only need reasonable suspicion to command exercises but it still has to be a voluntary consent so you can still argue popple you can still argue that this is acquiescing to authority that they didn't actually voluntarily consent this was an involuntary consent because they were acquiescing to authority uh state v louim that is an excellent case. That's one I was arguing recently as well. And that says that the officer did not have reasonable suspicion necessary to detain the defendant for the DUI investigation and requesting that he perform field sobriety exercises where the officer did not observe the indicia of impairment that is the prerequisite apart from an odor of alcohol. So then we go into clip house which is another very cited case that while the odor of alcohol is a factor that should be considered in determining reasonable suspicion the mere odor of an alcoholic beverage is not inconsistent with the ability to operate a motor vehicle in compliance with the law again remember it's not drinking and driving it's driving under the influence of alcohol to the extent that your normal faculties are impaired so i could have a glass of wine and then still be fine to drive. I will have the odor of an alcoholic beverage, but that does not necessarily mean that I'm impaired and there has to be more. And just to go back to Luim, this is especially, uh, this is where I wanted to discuss a case. It's not on here, because again, there's so many cases, but this is Wiggins v. Florida Department of Highway and Safety, which is a Florida Supreme Court case from 2017. It's 209 Southern 3rd, 1165. I can, if you guys want to contact me, I can send you guys the link for that. What that case states is that a court can reject an officer's testimony when it's contradicted or refuted by real time video evidence. Okay, so to give you a real life example of that, this is a motion of surprise that I just had last week where I was arguing that, you know, that it was an involuntary consent to the exercises. Okay, so in that case, I cited to Wiggins because we had video, we had the officer's, da we had the officer's dash cam, and the officer claimed lots of things. Amongst them was um, that the person had bloodshot eyes, flushed face, odor of alcohol, and then we watched the video, and First, we were contradicting the officer because 
the officer claimed lots of things about the driving pattern. It was a basic speeding case, but then the officer claimed, oh, well, he didn't pull over right away. And, you know, there were other places he could have pulled over. And when he did, it wasn't actually into a parking lot. It was into this, in this swale. And then he had a flushed face and, you know, he was, he was swaying a bit. But then we watched the video and literally the argument was judge. What the officer said is simply not true. Okay, we're looking at this video, we don't see a flushed face. We're looking at this video, we don't see bloodshot eyes. Odor of alcohol, okay, it doesn't matter. Clip House says odor of alcohol by itself is not enough. You know, speeding is not a driving pattern that is indicative of a DUI. So in that case, the judge agreed. And the judge granted my motion to suppress and specifically stated that the officer was contradicted by things in the video. Once you start contradicting an officer with anything in a video, all of a sudden their testimony becomes a lot less reliable and you can, you can knock out a lot of other things that that officer stated. All right, and in State v. Bertoni, this is, an, this is a, another great case where it talked about um, odor of alcohol, uh, red eyes, flush face, and combative attitude, but there was no observation of any kind of driving pattern. So in that one, the motion to suppress was granted. Again, remember, it's a totality of the circumstances. So if the driving pattern is weaving, failure to maintain a single lane, that in conjunction with a flush face or slurring and odor of alcohol will probably be enough for reasonable suspicion unless you can attack that. All right, and um, this is voluntary versus involuntary consent. This is what we were discussing in order to get around this new law saying that an officer can command or demand someone perform field sobriety exercises without probable cause that they just need reasonable suspicion. So again, while that is being settled in the courts, because again, it's, it's not quite settled yet, but again, I'll argue, argue that it's an involuntary consent. So Popple versus state obviously is a seminal case on that, but if you wanna get more specific in DUIs, the one that I argued was state v. Lynn, where the court held that the language used by the arresting officer in instructing a defendant to perform field sobriety exercises is consistent with finding that the defendant was acquiescing to apparent authority. And so then those were not voluntary. So in the, the motion to suppress that I just had, my client kept asking, well, why do I have to do this? Do I have to do this? Well, I don't really understand why I should do this. Okay, the judge in her ruling determined that clearly the person who was doing the field sobriety exercises, that this was not a voluntary consent because asking three times in a row, why am I doing this? Why do I have to do this? That's not a voluntary consent. Uh, the state's analogy in their argument was, well, judge, I can say, oh, I don't understand why I have to eat that soup. I don't understand why I have to eat it. It doesn't mean I won't eat it. So there you go. And I said, right, but if I'm gonna eat the soup after all that, then I wouldn't say I'm voluntarily eating the soup. I would say I'm eating the soup because I'm acquiescing to mom's authority or what have you. So again, don't be discouraged that some of the law has changed because you can always argue voluntariness. Okay, and then we have probable cause. So. Probable cause is something that you are always, always going to argue in your motion to suppress. And the reason is because a motion, you'd think that a motion to suppress where the judge agrees with you and also, and suppresses the exercises, you'd think that would be enough for them to null process the case. However, that's not actually true. Um, and there's a case here, it's not up here. It's uh, State v. Tuinen, T-U-I-N-E-N. It's 7 Florida Law Weekly Supplement 221A. It's a 17th Circuit case from 1999. Uh, and basically, that case just says it was a refusal to do the exercises, and uh, they were trying to su suppress the breath, saying that there was no probable cause to arrest them in order to get the breath because there were no exercises, and it was odor of alcohol, and just 
you know, slurring the other signs of impairment. And the court said, no, there was probable cause for the DUI arrest. So the breath came in. So what I what I recommend you do in your motion to suppress is you end it with a probable cause argument that is two sided. One, say, oh, well, assuming arguendo judge that you agree with us that there was no reasonable suspicion to do the exercises or that they did not voluntarily consent to do the field sobriety exercises. Um, then judge, we would argue there is no probable cause to arrest because without the exercises, then these are the only signs of impairment. Uh, and that is not enough. It's contradicted by the video, etc. And then go one step further and say, and judge, even if you do believe that the field sobriety exercises do come in, that there was reasonable suspicion to request the field sobriety exercises, there is still no probable cause because of A, B, and C. For example, uh, judge, you know, uh, there was no probable cause because they didn't do that badly on the exercises, or they had a, a hip replacement, and that's why they weren't able to do the exercises. You know, some of the factors that you might actually argue to a jury, you bring them in here. But again, you always want to argue the probable cause, even if it's not super strong, because you want to cover all your bases. So, for example, with that last motion to suppress that I just had, the state didn't null pros right away. Uh, they still haven't null pros it. So the judge in her ruling made it very specific, saying that, you know, even if the courts disagree with her on the reasonable suspicion, that she does not believe that there was probable cause to arrest regardless. That way, boom, all the bases are covered. And even if the state uh, appeals one part of it, then hopefully it's just, it, it still gets null pros because again, without probable cause to arrest and they don't have anything. So you always want to include this probable cause argument, especially on a double refusal. In a double refusal, your argument is really gonna focus on this, on the probable cause, because you're arguing that there is no probable cause, there was no breath, there is no exercises. So when this officer is asking you to perform field sobriety exercises, that's supposed to be to dispel suspicion. Mere suspicion is not enough for probable cause. Okay. Now the twinging case that I was talking about before, that was a double, that was a single refusal, but the court was only considering that first portion of it and they still did determine there was probable cause, but that's an older case. That's a 1999 case. And again, um, the state still likes to cite it, but just remember that, you know, probable cause argument, it, it's, it's, it's basically what you argue to the jury, but you're arguing it to the judge and you're arguing that uh, your client should not have been arrested. Okay. So this is where the slides end, but I did want to end it with something else which is that you do have to have a clear trial meeting. What does that mean? That means that, and I, I like to do this before the motion to suppress gets argued. So your client really knows and has an expectation of what's gonna be happening. But you know, in the clear trial meeting, the most important thing is that you want to have your notes from your initial client interview. You wanna show them the video and you want to discuss, you know, at, at that point, when you have your clear trial meeting, you are going to have taken the depositions, you have the transcripts, you have all the videos, you filed your motion to suppress. And this is where you bring the client into your office. Uh, this is really important because you cannot have the first time a client sees a DUI video at the trial or at the motion to suppress. Ideally, they've seen that video before. And, you know, this is really important because the client knows what they look like. Uh, they're going to be the best person to tell you, oh, well, that's how I always talk. Or, you know what, actually, um, I had I had I had played soccer the day before and I was really cramped up. So my legs hurt. I didn't tell the officer that because it wasn't really an injury, but I, I was hurt. So and also on the on the opposite side. Sometimes you think the client looks pretty good on video and they watch themselves and they get freaked out because they know what they look like and they say, wow, I, 
I look hammered on this video. So this is something you want to address because if they do feel that way, you can explain to them, look, I, I think you look fine. The jury is not going to hear you speak at trial. So they don't know what you sound like. And I don't think you're slurring. You might think you're slurring, but if they don't hear you talk, and an objective person thinks you're not slurring, then we leave it at that. But you have to address all of this with your client. And the reason I say bring your initial client interview notes with you is because as Manny was saying earlier, um, you know, one of the things you wanna address is your client's biggest fear. So some people will say, look, I can't lose my driver's license. Or some people say, I am terrified of going to jail. Uh, some people will say, you know what? I don't care, I wanna fight this case. That may be the case in the beginning, and then you actually show them the videos, you go over everything, most people change their minds. Um, that's when the client can make the truly informed decision of whether to go to trial. Because, you know, we tell clients, we will happily go to trial with you, but we want to make sure that you understand all of the nuances, all of the possible repercussions. This is where you want to tell your client um, what you know about your judge. You know, there are some judges where we say, you know what, double refusal in front of this judge, let's go to trial. You know, you're not going to go to jail. I mean, you can't guarantee it, obviously, but you know, you know, your judges. And then there are other judges where you look at it and say, yeah, you're probably going to get 10 days minimum if we lose, because that's how this judge is. And some clients are okay with that. Some people say, you know what, I'd rather... I'd rather do it because I've got, I think I've got a pretty good case and I cannot lose my driver's license. And even though we consider a reckless driving charge a win, the client might not because that usually means their license will be suspended. And um, although they can still get a hardship license for some clients, they cannot risk that suspension at all. And you know, for other clients, they'll say, look, I will do a reckless driving because all I care about is my record. And a reckless driving, you can have a withhold of adjudication, which means you can get that expunged versus a DUI is a mandatory adjudication. So there is no withhold on that. There is no expungement. There's no ceiling. The DUI is going to follow you forever. So for a lot of our clients, the reckless is the win because of the withhold. But again, you want to leave that up to the client. You know, as attorneys, we make a lot of decisions for clients, but whether or not to go to trial is up to them. We just advise them. So make sure you have a plea or trial meeting with a client. It's the easiest way to avoid any issues and any bar complaints. So with that being said, I think that's pretty much my time. Uh, I think we have a little bit of time for questions if anybody has any. I don't see any questions. So here's my information. Uh, feel free to reach out to me um, by email or whatever if you have additional questions. I know this is a lot of information to take in. So, you know, let that simmer a little bit and uh, hopefully I'll hear from you guys. All right. Hey, everybody. Um, Adam Rawson here, and this is. Uh, part three of our CLE. Um, this part, we're going to talk really about the basics of the standard field sobriety exercises and some of the science behind uh, DUI. Specifically, we'll be talking about breath tests, we'll be talking about uh, blood tests, and we'll be talking about urine tests um, after we go into a little bit more detail first about the field sobriety exercises. So hopefully, um, you know, the folks of you that are, are listening live and the ones that eventually watch the, the replay are getting a lot of great information out of this. Uh, please drop questions in, in the chat or the, the Q&A. You know, I want to make sure that everybody here um, you know, gets all their questions answered and, and we really are, are hoping you guys are loving this and we're providing good value, you know, for beginner level uh, DUI uh, cases. So the first thing I'm going to talk about, I'm going to talk about some parts that Manny already talked about um, but in a little more detail. And I'm going to talk also some parts that Mehdi just talked about in a little more detail as well from not so much of a case law perspective. So these standard field sobriety exercises, the SFSEs, what are they? right? These, these mythical things. <clears throat> well, they're exercises. They're not tests. And there is physical skill and dexterity involved. So that's something that I think is, is key for everybody to remember. 
um, these exercises, you know, it's balance, it's coordination. And as you see, one of the common themes that we tend to uh, discuss in front of, um, you know, especially in, in front of juries and the way that, you know, we're going to, I'm going to talk to you folks about this today is really how to set this up um, for arguments at a deposition, at a, at a, a DMV formal review, aka the bar hearing, or a trial, um, which I know David will then bring home, uh, you know, when I'm done in the in the fourth hour of our lecture. But <clears throat> these field sobriety exercises, they're done to establish probable cause, not guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. And that's one of the themes that I like to take in, in some of my trial work as well on these cases, is making sure that the jury understand that that the burden and the decision to arrest somebody at the side of, of the road for DUI, as many talked about, you know, is probable cause. It's not guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, what exactly what are they? Well, they're divided attention tasks designed to measure someone's quote unquote normal faculties. The problem is that they're no, abnormal exercises to measure the way you normally do something or the way our clients normally do something right so logically that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense um you know some police officers will even try to say that they're not abnormal which you know i look when, when we question these these police officers personally i don't care what they say because they're either going to a admit that they're abnormal or they're going to try to dig their feet in the ground, you know, and say, no, they're not abnormal, they're perfectly normal, and then they're going to lose credibility and look like an idiot in front of the jury. So <clears throat> here are some questions during cross-examination that you can ask, you know, um, or, and when I say cross-examination, um, it can be at a deposition, it can be at a, at a Bureau of Administrative Review hearing, and um, of course, the, these ones that I put here, they're not the traditional hard leading question. You can always make it a hard leading question, but I wanted it just to, you know, be the basic question for you guys here today. And again, th this is even good, um, as Manny was discussing, if you're using, if you don't get depositions in your jurisdiction, but you have that formal review hearing at the DMV, right? You want to ask these police officers what they think, because you want to know what they're going to say, um, you know, <clears throat> right? And these are just some of, of the few things, you know, on um, example, the, um, the walk and turn, right? No, we know people don't walk like this, heel to toe. We know they don't turn with a series of small steps the way that they do with their with their left foot planted on the ground. We know that somebody doesn't normally put up one foot six inches in the air with their arms by their side balancing on that remaining foot. Um, but we, you want to lock them in as early as possible just so you know and you have a better idea of, hey, is this police officer, am I going to need to really cross him hard and is he going to lose credibility with the with the jury? Or is this police officer going to, you know, give me the concessions that I need? Um, <clears throat> now, normal faculties are actually defined by the law. Okay, it's in the statutes, and it's defined right. It includes but not limited to the ability to see, hear, walk, talk, judge distances, drive an automobile, make judgments, act in emergencies, and in general to normally perform the many mental and physical tasks of our daily lives. The problem with these is that they confuse average with normal, okay? Um, you know, for everybody here that's on this webinar and, and the four lawyers that are doing this, if you take us all, you slice us, you know, take us all, combine us, slice us up in half, right, or divide us by the number, you would get an average. But that average is not what any one of us is. You know, the way, right, that's not how we talk, how we walk, how we judge distances or act in emergencies. And that's one of the big issues with this, is that the police officers, they confuse average with normal. Um, <clears throat> so you got to understand that. And that's one of our, our you know, one of my um, great themes in these cases. Um, and it's not a pass fail. Okay. So when they're asking you to do these exercises and, and if you comply or if your client complies and, you, and your client does them, um, <clears throat> you know, it's not that traditional pass or fail because that would, um, that would basically put more reliability on it. And the, the district courts have said that it's not pass fail. So that's good. So you want to make sure, you know, that, that the police officers aren't using that language. Um, 
these exercises must be done on a flat, well-lit surface, free and clear of debris. And one of the slides I'm going to show you in a few slides is one of the many examples that my firm has had where these um, exercises are not done on a flat, well-lit surface, free and clear of debris. So they're constantly violating their own rules and procedures. Um, <clears throat> now these, as Mehdi said, these exercises are non-testimonial, so the Miranda rights do not need to be read prior to the SFSEs. And there's five exercises that are generally used and three are officially recognized by NHTSA. So what is NHTSA? NHTSA is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. They're the ones that, you know, in conjunction with some other agencies, came up with these field sobriety exercises. They're the ones that have done some of the, you know, at least the studies that law enforcement relies on. However, in most cases, none of that's admissible in court. So you can't talk about for better or worse, meaning the prosecutors can't talk about how, you know, the combination of these three is 91% reliable and the defense attorneys can't talk about how, well, you know, this exercise is only 66% reliable and this one's 72% reliable and so on and so forth. Um, all that information is, is in all of NHTSA's books and guidelines, but, <clears throat> you know, I, I think that's really not necessary for today's DUI practitioner because most of the of the courts in Florida don't even let you know the attorneys get into that um, information and data but out of the five that are generally used three are officially recognized so you're going to are standardized so you're going to see those three you should on every single DUI case the first one is the horizontal gaze nystagmus which is commonly referred to as just the follow the pen exercise it's the eye test with the pen the second one is the walk and turn uh, <clears throat> if you've ever seen uh, the Reno 911 has done some great uh, it's great videos on that you can go on YouTube and check them out um, and the one leg stand now the fourth and the fifth are you know again it, it depends on the officer it depends on the jurisdiction but a lot of times they're they're quite often used as well and that's the finger to nose and the Romberg balance and the, um, and we'll go I'll go into all five of them for you folks one thing that's really, really, really important, and this also goes back to what Manny said earlier about the client interview, when you're trying to find out if your client has any injuries or illnesses or disabilities, and understand that injuries, illnesses, and disabilities are three separate and distinct things. They are not the same, but you want to find out from your client if they have any of those issues, and the police officers are supposed to be doing rule out questions to rule out any possible issues to make it fair. Uh, but quite often they don't. And there are a bunch of seated exercises that are commonly, well, that, that are used. <clears throat> I, I guess I won't say commonly because um, not everybody uses them, but there's about three or four that are trained. What you'll see is that most officers aren't trained in them. And, the, and sometimes there, there are officers that are trained in them, but for whatever reason, my opinion is they're lazy and they don't want to deviate to something that's not, you know, their, their script. Um, they'll rarely ever be used. And so that's great for cross-examination at trial. That's great for building your case to that point or to using that um, at a deposition or, or a formal review hearing and then using that again to negotiate with prosecutors for a reduced charge. So <clears throat> this is a case that we had, right? And this is a screenshot from a dash camera. This is a Florida Highway Patrol trooper in South Florida who used to be the main DUI person from Florida Highway Patrol in Broward County. He is no longer on the DUI unit because the prosecutors kicked him off the unit because he was so terrible. Um, I can proudly say that we've never, ever, ever lost a case that he was the arresting officer on. Um, we've never had, and what, what I mean by that is we've never, ever, ever had a client plea guilty or no contest to a DUI where he was the arresting officer. But when we look at this video, is that a flat, well-lit surface free and clear of debris? Well, it's lit. Okay, I'll give you, I'll give him that. It's not flat. It's not level. It's not free and clear of debris. And this case actually went to trial where the judge um, granted our motion for judgment of acquittal based on lack of impairment. And if you can see in this, <clears throat> there's puddles, okay? 
um, which if there's puddles being formed, then the area is clearly not level because the water has to go somewhere. Um, in this case, I know this is a screenshot, but in this case, there was it wasn't heavy rain, but there was light rain. Um, you can see rain droplets in those puddles. The picture um, our client's face is blurred out, but the police officer, his hand right now is actually on his face, wiping off a raindrop um, that's actively raining on him during these exercises. So you know, sometimes these exercises are completely unfair. And this is just a recent example of that. Um, <clears throat> you know, so these are things that you want to be on the lookout for uh, when your clients, when you get a client, you know, and they're doing the field sobriety exercises and you're reviewing this in, in discovery, uh, you want to really carefully look at this. I've had cases where back in the day, I would go out and take my own ruler or and slash level. You know, I went on Amazon and for 20 bucks bought like a ruler level combo. And I'd go out there and take pictures myself. And, and there's nothing, you know, right, when you look at something and you're like, eh, kind of looks level. And then you put a level there and the little bubbles all the way to the side. And it's clearly not. Um, now, of course, the best way to do that is to have a private investigator go out there and do that. So that way the lawyer's not, you know, doing it themselves for a whole host of reasons. Um, and that's the way we handle things now. But, you know, 15 years ago, very early on in my career, I you know, I liked doing it and it was fun. And if I knew it was going to trial, then I would have our private investigator at that time do it again themselves. But now we just, you know, we just send them out to make it official from, from the start. Um, <clears throat> so let's talk about the first um, exercise, the horizontal gaze nystagmus. Now, some DCAs in Florida allow police to talk about medical terms and nystagmus. Others don't. Uh, down here where we're at in Broward County, they do not let the police officers talk about that unless they are DRE certified, um, which is drug recognition evaluator. Um, <clears throat> now, um, down here, what they do allow is the follow the pen exercise. So basically, they'll allow the officer to, to, to say that you know, our client's eyes were not properly following the pen or they were swaying or they had balance issues during it, but they're not allowed to talk about nystagmus and the eye jerking and, and if what that means and if they believe that corresponds to any accompanying breath alcohol you know, uh, level. That, that's not allowed down here. Some DCAs in Florida do allow a little more leeway um, than, than they do in Broward County. But <clears throat> for me, you know, even when we have a DRE, I've always felt that that stuff is above the jury's head and there's some great materials that you can get to read on HGN um, and when you know of course you want to do this in a deposition or or a formal review hearing first because you want to cross the officer on it and find out their real true level of knowledge on this or are they just regurgitating what a workbook what they read you know in a workbook during a, a 20 hour you know or a 40 hour five day course right because of uh, of course, they're never going to be able to talk about HGN as an expert ophthalmologist would. Um, so you might want to test that. One of the great resources is Duane's, D-U-A-N-E-S. Um, it's actually a, a very popular medical journal <clears throat> or medical book um, specifically for ophthalmologists and optometrists. And that has a, a whole um, host of information about HGN. So if you want to learn more, I'd recommend reading Duane's. Um, <clears throat> but for the most, most part, I don't think it's necessary. The second exercise is the walk and turn. Now let's look at this little picture that I have here. This isn't from one of our cases. I, I got this courtesy of, uh, you know, of the internet. But is that a flat? Is that line flat and level? Right? No, it's on the side of the road, specifically for drainage, for water drainage. <clears throat> so even when they're doing it on the side of the road, a lot of times that's not a flat level surface. Um, what they're going to do is they're going to have your client stand in the instructional stance. And one of the big things they're looking at is the client, um, whether the client starts early or not. And it takes a solid minute to give the instructions for the walk and turn. And after they do, and they tell you when to begin, it's going to be nine steps forward, heel touching toe with your arms down by your side. Um, <clears throat> they're going to want you to count out the steps. And then when you hit the turn, it's a series of small steps. So it's not a military about face. It's not a step off the line and start again. You have to keep your left foot planted because you should end on your left foot if you're doing it correctly. 
and while your left foot is planted, you're taking a series of small steps around with your right, and then you begin again and you go nine steps back. Um, that's the basic walk and turn. Of course, it's a lot more complicated than that, and, and in a few more slides, I'm going to go over um, an example of how I crossed a police officer on that in a trial, and, um, and, and it was very effective. This, the next exercise, the third of the three that are standardized, is the one leg stand. Again, they're going to want you to stand in the instructional stance, and that's basically just going to be, <clears throat> you know, feet together, arms down by your side. Um, and when feet together, they're going to make you put your feet, you know, together um, with your knees together. And I know for some people, that's even, even that alone is very hard to do. You're going to raise your legs six inches off the ground. You're going to keep your arms at your side, and you're going to count 1,001, 1,002, et cetera, until you get to, you know, until you get 30 seconds. And, and they're going to time you for 30 seconds. And you should get to, one, you know, 1,030 at that time. But most people don't. Um, things that they're looking for in this, you know, they're looking for, are you raising your hands? Uh, do you have any balance issues? Are you hopping on one foot? Do you put your foot down? And so those are the things that, that they're looking for. And, and these officers, they have their own checklists. So they're sitting there literally just checking off boxes. Of course, they'll never say what you did well. They'll only check off the things that you did poorly. Now, the finger to nose is, is one, again, that we talked about that's not NHTSA approved. Um, and here's you know, a picture of the old school way to do it. They used to have you do it with your arms out. Um, and as of about three, four years ago, they're, they're, they want you to keep your arms down by your side and bring them up directly. But <clears throat> there is that same instructional stance as the one leg stand. Um, with your arm, OK. And on the old school version, they're going to want your arms out, your index fingers pointing out, close your eyes, and tilt your head back. They're looking for balance issues. They're looking for coordination. Um, a lot of these officers will have a literal nose on their sheet, and they're going to be marking the exact part of the nose that you touched. And one of the ways that they really try to trick people is they say the tip of your finger to the tip of your nose. And when you do, if you can see right here, when you do that, that's actually incorrect. Because what that is is the finger pad. And the way they demonstrate is with the fingertip. So the way they demonstrate is this way. And we've had clients do this perfectly, except they use the pad and not the tip. And officers have said, I'm sorry, you know, I'm making the arrest. Um, and now that's, that's ridiculous. Those cases are great for trial, are great, you know, for negotiating with prosecutors. But, you know, unfortunately, that's what they're looking for. And that's how particular they are on these exercises and it's really unfortunate for people that are you know maybe had a drink or two like uh like you know like we talked about earlier like many talked about earlier where you're allowed to consume alcohol you just can't be impaired or over the legal limit at the time you're driving and somebody has you know one drink and they do that <clears throat> and they're off by doing this instead of this you know to me it's just it's kind of that it's really petty and it's kind of you know like ha gotcha type of thing, which, you know, um, that's why we do what we do. We fight against those things. And the last one is the Romberg balance, which is just stand together, feet arms, <clears throat> you know, feet together, arms by your side, close your eyes, tilt your head back, and estimate 30 seconds. Um, you know, I think the, the cases where you're estimating 30 seconds in 15 or 45 or 60, obviously that's a little worse than 25 or 33 seconds. But really, they're just they're looking for eyelid tremors, they're looking for balance issues, and they're looking for not being able to effectively and grossly um, mis, uh, miscalculating time in that situation. <clears throat> so I talked a little bit about you know depositions and, and Bureau of Administrative Review hearings, and I wanted to give you guys some just a few good questions to ask, right? Because if one of the themes on this case, especially if, if your client, if it's your client's first DUI, you can weave that in there in a little bit of a sneaky way, right? And basically, you want to ask the officer, how many times did it take for them to practice the standard, the SFSEs before they could do it perfectly, right? <clears throat> because 
really in their mind they are seeking perfection and we want you want a jury to understand that hey wait a minute this is a setup nobody can do perfection um you know and that it's it's not fair to people obviously you can talk to them about the training and the classes they undergo and how they're doing them and they're doing them multiple times to practice um <clears throat> okay and you really want to focus as well on all of the normal actions that your client did and what they did correctly, such as how they pulled the car over after the lights were activated. Obviously, if that's on video and they pull over quickly, you know, I, I love it when we can we can calculate that within one or two seconds, the car, my, our client's brake lights turn on, right? <clears throat> that's gold. Because if we're going to be talking about divided attention, which is what these exercises, these abnormal things are designed to measure, why don't we measure the divided attention that is normal instead, such as looking in the rear view, eyes see blue lights. Blue lights from your eyes tell your brain that you're being stopped, which tells your foot <clears throat> to go from the gas to the brake, which tells your hands to slow down and then slowly and carefully pull the wheel over, right? That's divided attention, <clears throat> but those are normal divided attention tasks instead of these abnormal things that people don't do that people need to learn how to do. Um, <clears throat> so, so those, you know, I, I really like that line of questioning. Um, obviously, if your client walks out of the car or gets out of the car normally, walks over to the area normally, and that's on a body camera or an in-dash camera, then you want to use those things. Anything that your client did well, you you want to exploit and really focus on. Um, you know, because again, if if it's a normal thing that your client's normal faculties are doing, then to me that's a lot more reliable than these abnormal things. Um, back to what we said earlier, the officers often confuse average with normal, and you know these are. You know, it, they're not one. They're, they make them one size fits all, but that's not the way that they're supposed to be, and that's and we shouldn't accept that, right? Um, <clears throat> and there's a difference between if your performance is prevented versus affected. So a lot of times they'll ask you, you know, do you have any injuries that would prevent you from doing these simple little tasks? Well, if your foot's amputated, you're prevented from doing the walk and turn, right? But if you have a bad ankle or a torn ACL, right, or some other injuries, then your performance is affected. And the words that the police officers use matter, but they never use it in those words. So somebody might say, yeah, sure, there's nothing wrong that would prevent me. And then they're not thinking about, <clears throat> well, yeah, I have that ACL that would affect my ability or hampen or diminish my ability. And again, seated exercises are rarely used but available, and it's a great point for cross-examination. Um, <clears throat> so what are some examples of these normal faculties, right? We went over them, of course, from what the statute said, but speech. We all, <clears throat> and these are things that you, to the extent that the judge will let you, you want to get into this as much as possible in jury selection. And I, and I know David next is going to talk about trial and jury selection. But you want to, my personal belief is you want to push that limit. You want to go, go, go until a judge says you can't. That's just, you know, my belief. But of course, everybody else can have their own um, way of doing things. But speech, we don't all talk the same. Some people have accents. Some people mumble. Some people mispronounce words while under stress, right? Walk and balance. We don't all walk the same. Um, <clears throat> you know, injuries, age, weight are factors. For the women that wear high heels, right, you know, that's obviously going to be very difficult. Men or women wearing dress shoes, that's difficult. We all can't wear military boots or, you know, basketball shoes with, you know, perfect support and protection um, to do these exercises. Um, of course, we couldn't argue that um, footwear issues in the case in that screenshot I showed you earlier because that client was wearing basketball shoes and did have really good support and protection. Um, but luckily, the, you know, the the location that the trooper chose was so terrible that it didn't matter, um, right? Mental faculties. How do we learn? Some of us are visual learners. Some of us are tactile learners. Some, right, we need to practice. Some of us are quicker learners than others. And what about how we act in emergencies? You know, we have those, those people that are very stoic and calm, 
and then we have the nervous Nellies. And so <clears throat> it's really important to understand um, the difference in people and how they oftentimes confuse average with normal. Now, here's a, an example from a case. This is a walk and turn, and this was done on video um, <clears throat> by, by a police officer in a trial that I had. And she basically sped through rapid fire these instructions for the walk and turn. And what I did was I broke them down into each and every separate instruction. Okay. And <clears throat> when I did that, I, I got her to admit that there was that she gave our client 17 different instructions while, of course, he was standing in that instructional stance, which the walk and turn is you have to stand heel to toe with your arms down by your side and balance for a minute. And then he actually got 14 out of the 17 correct. And it was a bit slow, a bit methodical, but I really wanted to hammer home that point that this is somebody who's never done these before, has never practiced, got rapid fire questions, you know, or instructions from an officer under a stressful situation. And yet he did 17 out of, 14 out of 17 correctly. And it went really well. It went, it went over very well with the jury. It was a very effective cross-examination. So you folks can do that too and break it down um, into the numbers. <clears throat> you know, I, I feel like when you give, when you question on how many specific instructions and how complicated these are, that really resonates well with the jury. Um, now, I've heard many, um, many lectures on DUI where, the lecturers have said they don't want people who are used to judging others. Um, and generally, I agree. However, if your theme is going to be clients first time ever doing these and attacking the exercises as complicated and too hard and, you know, no room for error, then some then I in those situations like teachers, coaches and office managers, because Yes, they can be a little judgy, authoritative figures, but they have experience with people who are learning. And they have experience knowing, oh, geez, Bob, you need to tell Bob 10 times before Bob really gets it. You know, of course, and right? Um, you can't just tell Bob or show Bob once and, and he's going to, you know, he's never going to get it right. He's, he needs some time. Um, so if you know that's going to be your theme, which in some cases it is, in some cases it's not. Or, or not just the theme, a big part of the case, then me personally, I do like some of those um, those professionals on, on my jury. But those are things for you to, of course, flesh out in voir dire, and I know David will go over more um, in more detail that, um, especially if, if the impairment looks slight or moderate. You know, if somebody's fallen all over the place, then, you know, you might have, a, a, you know, it might, not, it might go to trial, it might not, but you may have different arguments. This is the end of the field sobriety portion. We're going to talk about the breathalyzer. We're going to talk about um, urine testing and a little bit about blood testing as well. So first of all, as we're talking about <clears throat> the breathalyzer, in Florida right now, we use the Intoxilizer 8000. And one of the things that I tell all of our clients, you know, anytime we lecture, is do, and to lawyers as well, do not be afraid of a high breath test. Um, we hear it so often, well, I blew high, I blew over, my lawyer told me there's nothing that can be done. And that's just simply not true. Um, of course, there's so many motions to suppress that can, you know, invalidate a breath test. Or if, as what Medi talked about earlier, if the stop's bad, then it doesn't matter if the client had a 4-0 breath. It doesn't matter if the client had 10 kilos of cocaine. Stop's bad. Everything else that comes from it is bad, as we all know from law school. But <clears throat> don't be afraid of a high breath test. High breath tests can be one. You just have to attack, you know, the breathalyzer. Um, the Intoxilizer 8000, that's what's currently used. Now, it was first manufactured by CMI in 2001, and it was finally approved and used in Florida in 2006. So if you think about that, this machine, computer, whatever, they call it an instrument, because I personally don't know why, I guess it sounds fancy, but this, this machine, it's older than smartphones, okay? Back then, we all had our Motorola Razor or our Nokia phone, right? <clears throat> okay, if, if, if you guys, if you folks remember that. 
uh, Windows, I we were on Windows Vista. Okay? Um, so when you talk in terms like that, those are things that jurors can wrap their head around. Everybody who's, you know, <clears throat> right, who was around then remembers Windows Vista and how clunky it was. They remember the Motorola Razor flip phone and the Nokia phones. And to us now, that seems as ancient technology. So even though it's only been 15 years, it's been ancient technology. Um, and the, tech, the actual technology behind it is infrared radiation technology from you know, decades ago. Um, <clears throat> so as we break down the breathalyzer, the picture on the right is the Intoxilizer 8000. And as you can see up at the top, there's a handle on it, uh, which I'll talk a, bit, a little bit about later. On the left, right, this is a great picture of, you know, some wacky invention, one of the precursors to the breathalyzer back, you know, 40, 50, 60 years ago. And, and really, I don't think much has really changed between the picture on the left versus the picture on the right. So <clears throat> as we break this down, we're going to focus on just a few of the common areas of unreliability because you know, in order, I mean, we could go real deep over four or five hours on this stuff alone, but I just, I want to give a few of the most common areas of unreliability with this machine, and it all does boil down to junk science. So we're going to talk about breath temperature. We're going to talk about partition ratio. We're going to talk about margins of error, time of driving, the O2O agreement that many also briefly discussed, and source code issues with the actual, you know, um, machine and how it, it does its calculations. Um, so let's start first start talking about breath temperature errors and issues with it. They, and what I said before about them confusing average with normal is the exact same with this quote unquote science part to it. They're confusing average with normal, okay? If you've ever heard the phrase garbage in, garbage out, right? Or you're only as good, especially for the mathematicians here, um, you're only as good as your equation right? Um, it's the same stuff. So what they do is they will estimate your breath temperature at 34 degrees Celsius, which is 93.2 degrees Fahrenheit. A higher breath temperature will yield a false positive or an increase in what your breath alcohol content, what, you know, higher, it'll measure higher than what it really is. A lower breath temperature will actually <clears throat> decrease the BAC. And there was a study from 1995 where they had 700 subjects and found that breath temperatures actually ranged from 33 to 36.7. And the study recommended a 35 degree Celsius instead of 34 average, um, <clears throat> which is statistically significant. And if that is true, and if that is a safer, more conservative average, then the Intoxilizer 8000 is overestimating you know, the vast majority of the breath tests that are conducted with it, um, okay? And this, the technology is not there to actually measure that breath temperature. Um, so they have to do all of these, these calculations, and, and it's wrong. Um, <clears throat> you know, so when you, and if you have officers or, or you know, breath, tech, breath techs that understand this, right, then they should give you some concessions. If they don't understand it, then you can really rip them apart and just have some fun going after them on this stuff. Um, but again, of course, we recommend you want to know the people in your local jurisdiction and how they're going to answer these questions. So you want to get in the habit of doing these formal review hearings and if you can, take depositions on these cases. The second thing that I want to discuss is partition ratio. Um, <clears throat> and it, it's derived from Henry's Law. You can Google Henry's Law. I don't think it's that important for what we're discussing, you know, um, to go too deep into that. But more or less, it's the conversion. Um, you know, Henry's Law is a little different, but the partition ratio is the conversion from breath to blood levels. Okay. And of course, it assumes a closed system at 34 degrees Celsius. So that's why I started with breath temperature first and foremost, because even partition ratio you know, makes a variety of assumptions. Okay? The, the partition ratio that the Intoxilizer 8000 uses is 2100 to 1. But in studies, they've shown that 
partition ratios in human beings vary from 900 to 1 to about 3,400 to 1. And there was a study from 1983 that said that the correct partition ratio should be uh, 1,756 to 1. And if true, <clears throat> again, it means that the intoxilizer 8,000 is overestimating breath tests because people that have a lower partition ratio are having a higher reading on the breath test than what is actually in their body or in their blood. Um, and that's another example of false positives. Okay? Where, you know, and when you combine multiples of these false positives, you can see that somebody may actually have a blood alcohol level of 06, and yet they're blowing an 09 or a 10, and it is significant. We're not talking about just a few numbers here. Um, <clears throat> now, the thing about the closed system, right, and, and I'm going to talk about this a little bit actually next, you know, our bodies what's going in from our body into that machine is not a closed system. It's not under perfect ideal conditions like their own testing is. You know, they test these machines every month. They have simulators, um, <clears throat> right? And these simulators have, you know, they're basically solutions that have the specific amount of, um, you know, the exact amount of, of ethanol in these solutions. And yet, even these, when they do the testing, there's a margin of error. So let me go into that next. So this is a picture, right, of one of the monthly inspections that, that they do and they have to submit to FDLE. The great news is that all of this data is available on FDLE's website. And I think in the next a few slides later, I'll, I'll have that information for you. But when they are doing these tests, they do three tests, an, o, an 05, an 08, and a 0.20. And they have acceptable ranges on these tests. So in order for a test to or a machine to fail inspection, it has to be on an 05 test below 045 or above 055. So there's basically a 10 point swing that's allowed, right, on these, um, as on the 05 and the 08 and the 20 test, there's a 20 point swing that's allowed. And yet this is perfect ideal conditions. There's not going to be anything more accurate than a tested and inspected solution that has the exact amount of ethanol in it in an actual closed system, meaning not a human being's body that has to deal with temperature issues, that has to deal with are you sick, are you not, that has to deal with how much breath volume, you know, how hard and deep do you blow into the machine that doesn't have to deal with, you know, do you have dental work, did you burp, regurgitate, do, you know, are you coughing, do you have um, acid reflux or GERD, right? All of those things that can potentially be issues for, with us as human beings, you don't have in a closed laboratory style testing and yet they get a higher margin of error than what you know we get <clears throat> right it doesn't make sense at all and these are things that when you do you know if you do go to trial on a breath test you should be using you should be cross-examining them and of course like i've said many times you want to know how these people, um, you know, these breath text agency inspectors are going to react and answer those questions that you ask. So the picture on the right, right, it's a scale. It's a broken scale. The <clears throat> O2O agreement. So an O, if you give two breath samples and one is an 079 and one and the other, the second is an 098, both are valid samples under the law because they're within 0.020 of each other. Um, <clears throat> if you, st you know, one of the great things that I like to do, and it, it's not unique to, to me or to us, right? It's common, but you know, you can, if you can get away with it in voir dire, fantastic. If you, you know, do it, <clears throat> if you save it for close, that's great too. But you know, if you got on a scale and it said 079 or 79 pounds, and then you got back on the scale and it said 98. You know, there's no way that that scale is accurate. We're throwing it out. We're buying a new one. It's garbage. And yet, 
these prosecutors and these police officers want you to believe that that machine is accurate. Um, it just does not fly. One of the other things that you can easily um, cross-examine on that leads to unreliability is time of driving. Now, some of the jurisdictions have, have handled this in a little bit of a better way recently, but when they bring you back down to the BAT facility, to the breath alcohol testing facility or in your jurisdiction, there's usually between an hour and two hours after the time of driving from when that your client gives that breath test. Now, sometimes now they're bringing the intoxilizer 8,000 on scene. They're putting them in SUVs. I know many talked a little bit about that a little earlier, um, <clears throat> how one particular officer that we've been dealing with says he doesn't bring his out because of radio frequency RF you know, I interference. Um, but it is portable. So if you have a breath test and it's given an hour and a half, two hours later, right, you can really cross-examine the, the officer's um, and the breath text about the portability of this machine because when they're doing DUI saturation patrols and they're doing DUI checkpoints they do bring them out with their mobile units right so it's you know this machine I mean it's a little bigger than a laptop right opened uh, but it's portable it, it has a handle it has batteries it has an AC adapter you just bring it and you plug it in right <clears throat> so um, it's not our job as defense lawyers to prove what the breath alcohol level was at the time of driving or to prove that it wasn't a 0.08. Remember, it's the prosecutor's job to prove that our client was over 0.08 at the time they were driving. And alcohol is absorbed and eliminated on a bell curve, right? And so, you know, it's the prosecutor's job to prove whether you were absorbing or eliminating alcohol, and they can't do that. Um, it's very hard for them to do retrograde extrapolation. I don't want to get too much involved in that stuff but <clears throat> for today, but it's very hard, um, and they're not going to be able to do it. And the last thing is uh, CMI, the manufacturer of the breath test, their trade secrets. So their source code. They've never divulged the source code. They've spent hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, defending um, and preventing the source codes from being disclosed to defense attorneys in multiple in every single state in which they have contracts with. So you can't go under the hood of this machine. No police officer in Florida has ever opened up the Intoxilizer 8000 while they've been a police officer, because if they did, they would be fired and FDLE would lose their contract. So ask these breath tests if they've ever, quote unquote, gone under the hood. Right. <clears throat> and uh, from a kind of a, a, you know, another practice, you know, trial standpoint, I like having, you know, if this is going to be part of your defense, you may want a mechanic on your jury, somebody who is handy, somebody who can directly relate if you're going to use that, you know, you didn't go under the hood of this machine. So you've never inspected it. You don't even know what's inside of it, do you? It's a bunch of tubes and wires and microchips, right? Maybe a computer repair person. You know, anybody who, who knows that, no, wait a minute, you know, machines and technology break and sometimes are wrong, you got to open it up and you got to take a look and you got to fix it. Um, so this argument can go really well with people like that, um, if, if that is going to be your theme, you know, so that that's important. <clears throat> um, now, these are some screenshots here. First of all, on the, on the left, um, we have the link and FDLE has kind of uh, made it harder and harder to find the breath alcohol testing um, records on FDLE's website. So just use that direct link because it's very difficult now to find on the homepage of FDLE when it used to be very easy to find, of course, right? Surprise, um, not really. But these screenshots just show some different examples of the immense data that you can get from FDLE's website about these breathalyzers. And you have to go through these. You have to go through these on every single case. Sometimes there's a bit of a backlog. So if your client gets arrested yesterday and hires you tomorrow, you know, it's not going to be available right away. It may take a few months, but that's your judges push you to trial in 90 days on a DUI because, especially on a breath, a breath case, because you got to do the work. And how can you effectively represent somebody if you're not looking at these records, you know, the maintenance records, right? And, and the more subject, um, the subject test data records, which the one on the bottom left is going to, actually, I'm sorry, it's not the one on the bottom left. That's a, that's an inspection. But when you look at 
your client's specific breath test, um, the the computer printout that the police get that the prosecutors use is basically a summary version and there's more details at the FDLE page that they have to upload to FDLE. So this stuff is really invaluable for your cases. You, you really want to be on that. Um, <clears throat> here's a quote from a judge in Orange County. It's a Florida Law Weekly case from uh, eight years ago, but this is great. And this quote was actually quoted in the New York Times two years ago. There was a fantastic article in the New York Times about how breath breathalyzers across the country are unreliable and have led to false convictions. So um, I highly recommend you read that article. But the intoxilizer 8000 is a magic black box assisting the prosecution in convicting citizens of DUI. The defendant is required to blow into the box. The defense has shown significant and continued anomalies in the operation of the intoxilizer 8000's operation. The prosecution argues most of the tests do not show uh, um, anomalies. In fact, a high percentage of the test may show no anomalous operation. That the intoxilizer 8000 mostly works as an insufficient response when a citizen's liberty is at risk. That's powerful. Um, that's an extremely powerful quote. So if you are going to be filing motions to suppress on these issues, you know, that's a fantastic quote to put. Um, and it's just, you know, it's a really powerful statement just to add in there. Of course, that's not really necessarily a legal basis. Um, but when you're making these arguments, you know, the fact that a judge said that is, is very powerful, I believe. Um, what I want to do next <clears throat> is go over urine and blood samples. Um, very brief, you know, overview. So urine, you know, we're going to see this more and more on drug DUI cases, uh, especially now, you know, that the police aren't making marijuana really related arrests in, in our state, you know, very much at all. <clears throat> We're going to see a huge increase in DUID or DUI drug cases. And the states where marijuana is, you know, recreationally legal, um, you know, they've had a tremendous spike in DUI drug cases. But understand, urine is nothing more than a waste byproduct of what was once in your blood or aka in your body. Think about urine in your bladder like a Ziploc bag that just happens to be inside of you but it's not really a part of you or affecting you. And that's the way, <clears throat> you know, that I want people to consider this and I want our jurors to consider this, right? Your urine is in your bladder. Um, yes, it's inside of you, it's a part of you, but it's not really because it's just a holding tank waiting to be expelled. Um, <clears throat> and urine testing is extremely unreliable for drug DUI cases. It's very difficult for their experts, the state's experts, um, to extrapolate back to time of driving. And any good, legitimate forensic scientist will put no weight at all in a urine result for a DUI case. All it says is that at some point a person used a substance. It doesn't say when, doesn't say how much. It doesn't say how they used that substance, such as was it, you know, if it was, we're talking prescription medication, was it used as prescribed? Uh, they won't or should not be able to give an opinion on whether the drugs found in your client's system were therapeutic or impairing, right? Um, and that's a big, big, big distinction because there's no legal limit for drugs in a DUI case. And you have to combat a little bit of the stigma that people have when we're talking, especially about illegal drugs, right? Heroin, cocaine, you know, still marijuana, but even prescription drugs, because people I've found will, you know, default to, oh, well, you can have a drink or two at dinner and drive home, that's okay. But oh, you obviously, if you have cocaine in your system, that's terrible, that's illegal. But even if you have Vicodin or oxycodone or soma or xanax in your system right without being without being able to understand that for the vast majority of people that take that there are therapeutic non-impairing levels right and there is no per se legal limit so again it goes back on the prosecution to prove that you were impaired by that okay and that, that's a huge distinction um and take depositions um, of these toxicologists, the medical examiners, whoever's doing that. I believe even in the jurisdictions that don't like giving depositions, you know, when you have a urine case and they list an expert witness, that is good cause um, to take that expert's deposition. 
and I believe you should be ordering the transcripts and saving the transcripts and creating a transcript bank uh, of what people of what witnesses are going to say so you have that throughout all of your cases. Um, finally, we're going to talk a little bit about blood. You'll see it in the following circumstances, really DUI, manslaughter, vehicular homicide, serious bodily injury, <clears throat> you know, or if a breath test is impossible or impractical. Um, for today, that's really all I, I really want to discuss specifically about blood besides um, going into the medical records investigative subpoenas. That I think is really important to go over for the, the new practitioner. Um, okay, and so medical records, investigative subpoenas, it could be urine, it could be blood, right? Usually it's, we're talking fire rescue and we're talking medical records. Okay, well, medical records could be fire rescue or it could be at the hospital. The state must serve you a notice of intent to, to serve a subpoena ducis tico. You have 10 days to object. Always, always, always object. Even if you know that there's, we're going to lose, you're going to lose. And the majority of the time you lose these. Um, you have to object. Let make the prosecutors do their job. Make them set a hunter hearing, which comes from State v. Hunter, which is basically a hearing on, you know, of whether or not your client's um, privacy, medical privacy interests are greater than the state's, you know, interest in getting this information to prosecute a crime. Um, <clears throat> we've prevented medical records on cases after a hunter hearing was granted, or I'm sorry, um, just by objecting because a state forgot to send a hunter forgot to set a hunter hearing. So we've had cases where we filed our timely objection and then seven months later we're ready to you know prepare the case for trial or file a motion to suppress and they just they never they forgot about it. Um, you know it happens a little bit more in the jurisdictions that are larger and the prosecutors are you know drowning in cases but you got to make them do their job right. So that's something that I think you know has really helped us in some some cases. Um, at the Hunter hearing, the state must prove a nexus between the information sought and the crime alleged to overcome the defendant's medical privacy rights. And again, most of the time you're going to lose. It's very easy for them to prove that nexus. But we force them to do their job. Um, <clears throat> you know, we've had other cases where prosecutors have received the records and then they never file a supplemental discovery. And then they were barred from using them at trial or at a motion. Um, and what I like to do is I like to request that the judge review the records in camera prior to distribution to the prosecutors and defense. So I like it when the pro when the judges say, I'm going to sign the subpoena deuces tecum, but it's coming to me, not coming to you state. And again, we've had some cases where the judge never received it and there was no follow up at all. So make them jump through as many hoops as possible um, when you're doing you know, when you're defending against these medical records investigative subpoenas, you know, it's all about maximizing your client's chance to win this case. Um, hopefully, you know, that this kind of surface level overview really helps you folks. Um, you know, of course, we have our QR code. You can call us, you know, me or anybody from my firm at, at any time. We love talking this stuff. We love helping out. And um, hopefully we can even do it an advanced one sometime. That's all I got for you guys. Thank you very much. Hey everybody, we're going to jump right in here. Uh, my name is David Terrace, partner at the Rawson Law Firm. I'm going to be talking to everybody about what, as a trial attorney, should be your favorite part uh, of a DUI case, which is the DUI trial experience. Now, based on everything that you've heard so far, it's not always actually the most important part of a case, right? Our firm, everyone, whether you're a public defender or otherwise, should always be trying to beat the case with motions, um, get fantastic resolutions that your client uh, wishes to accept, uh, but the cases do go to trial. We try a lot of cases, uh, and you have to be prepared. Okay. A quick, quick remark. You know, a lot of the sections. I'll go to the next slide here first. A lot of the sections that we're going to be discussing. Um, we'll start off with a bit of an introduction, then go into motions and limine jury selection, cross-examination, JOA, and then closing argument. Um, especially jury selection and cross-examination, those could be CLEs by themselves, okay, hour-long CLEs. Um, it's better, we're going to talk, you know, in the most most detail, but also um, with, with time constraints and the fact that this is your first DUI trial, uh, making sure that some of these complex concepts 
um, are uh, are taken care of in, in a more summary type way. Okay, so we're going to jump into the first slide here. So starting with theory of defense. Um, theory of defense is where you start off with in every single case. And the theory of defense or um, the related theme, and we'll talk about that, that should be uh, essentially being developed in your mind from the very, very first time you see the police report. Okay, And uh, what you're reading about, you want to always think something that is, has, as I was trained, how we try cases, um, the best trial lawyers will get a police report and their mind jumps directly to theory of defense and then sometimes even jumps uh, all the way to closing argument. Um, even if it's what's considered a bad case, uh, a case that you feel in your jurisdiction is very likely to resolve, um, you still, every good trial attorney is thinking about closing argument, is thinking about that theory of defense that is going to be pervasive uh, throughout their entire presentation uh, of their defense at trial. Okay, so there's theory of defense and then theme. Um, as I say here, as you can see in the slide, it's the foundation of every decision that you make in a DUI jury trial. Okay, uh, themes work because they simplify complex um, issues for DUI. DUI can be, DUI trials can be as complex, if more, not more complex than murder trials, okay? Um, and they have special considerations that we're going to talk about. Um, you know, the, the theory of defense, I say here, if you can't say your theme in one sentence, but really that's more so the theory of defense should be able to be said in one sentence, maybe two. It is the just bare bones why your client should be found not guilty. And then you can develop themes, which are usually more catchy, which you like to use uh, to start off your opening statement and then repeat throughout trial um, and build up during voir dire, um, which we're going to talk about jury selection. Um, but theory of defense should be, you really should be able to say it in one word. If someone asks you, what's your theory of defense? And it's taking you more than one or two sentences, um, then it's probably not a strong enough theory of defense. Now, you can have multiple theories of defense, but being that this is your first jury trial, try and keep it as simple as possible. Uh, one other thing about the presentation you're going to see it, and that's important to note is that we are going to be talking about jury trials, okay? Um, I, in my career as a trial attorney trying DUIs and other cases, I've only had one bench trial on a DUI, and that was because the judge um, essentially said uh, it was probably wrong. The state probably could have appealed him, but he said, uh, Mr. Terrace, take this case to me, bench. This is ridiculous. I promise you it'll work out fine. Um, he, he very likely could have been appealed. Uh, it didn't happen that way, but uh, we don't do bench trials. We don't advise anybody um, to take a bench trial. Um, you want a jury, you want your client's freedom uh, in the hands of the jury, okay? Um, and to boil down essentially what a theory of defense is, it's something that should be repeated, your theory of defense and then your theme of the case should be repeated uh, throughout the trial in different ways, which we'll talk about. Um, but it really comes down to if the jury goes back to deliberate, um, and they can only take one line, one or two lines, one or two statements with them in a hypothetical world. Um, and you would want it to be your theory of defense. You would want that just being pervasive, being at the forefront of their mind when they're looking at evidence, when they're looking at the videos, rewatching the videos, uh, re uh, hearing audio recordings of, this, of testimony, thinking about the testimony when they're back there deliberating. You want this theory of the defense uh, or this or the theme, these catchy one or two liners to be essentially um, uh, changing the way they look at every single piece of evidence or lack thereof. OK, so developing a strong theory of defense is rule number one. 
uh, a DUI trial and, and any trial for that matter. Uh, but I, I do believe it's especially especially important in a DUI case. Okay, so first section we have here is motions and limine. You'll see this picture here, uh, classic quote. Um, it's attributed to a lot of different people, uh, but I think Jack Dempsey was the original. I'm a boxing fan myself. Um, and the quote is, the best defense is a good offense. Um, and that is essentially the point of a motion and limit. Okay. Um, we're putting ourselves in a position that before the trial even starts, we have already chipped away at the state's case. Okay, and there's a lot of different ways to do this. So the purpose is to set the ground, the general purpose of a motion in limine is to set the ground rules uh, for the upcoming trial in your favor and limit the state's case and, har and harmful evidence uh, as much as possible. Okay, and it comes down to prejudice. Okay, limiting out um, information, evidence, testimony that the state would intend to present that would be harmful to your theory of defense in your case, okay? Um, there's a quote here, it's a good case. Um, motions and limine should be filed to prevent the introduction of improper evidence, the mere mention of which at trial would be prejudicial and potentially leading to a mistrial, okay? Uh, so very, very important concept. Um, going on to the next slide. Uh, very important part here that I wanna talk to you about. Motions in limine, just like motions to suppress, and really every aspect of your trial presentation, uh, your defense, cannot, should not and cannot be generic. Um, and this is maybe especially true when it comes to motion in limine. So much about trial practice is not only gaining credibility with the jurors, gaining credibility, of course, and the trust of the human being sitting next to you, your client who who has put their their trust and freedom uh, in your hands, but also gaining credibility with the judge early on. Um, one of the things that I have seen the biggest pitfalls of attorneys who are trying their first D, uh, DUI um, defenses at trial is filing a boilerplate motion in limine. Okay, big big no no. Okay. The reason, the reason why that is, and it might sound kind of silly, but you, I have heard time and time again when attorneys have decided to file a boilerplate motion in limine is you're going to get a comment from the judge that says, Mr. Terrace, I will just go ahead and assume that you know the laws of evidence and that everybody else in my courtroom knows the laws of evidence, and they're just going to toss it out. You might not even be able to get your rulings on it. They're going to say, this is not a motion in limine. I'm not hearing this. And there's things about objections that could come into it, but you don't want to get to that point. Um, so you want your motions in limine to be specific, okay, specific to the facts of your case. So, for example, not enough to just say the prosecutor, you know, point number one, motion in limine, the prosecutor cannot talk about prior bad acts. Well, great, the judge is gonna say, I'm sorry, Mr. Terrace, uh, did you need uh, to tell me, do you think that I don't know the evidence code and the rules of procedure? Um, and that's gonna look really bad in front of your client and it's just gonna get everything started uh, you know, on the wrong foot. Fortunately, the jury wouldn't be there for that, um, but you have to be specific, okay? Um, so when we're, when we're working on our motions in limine, a couple different things that we want to consider, okay? There's, I give you common, the next few slides, I know it's a lot of writing. Um, you're gonna have access to these slides. It involves case law, but these are the common, the most common grounds um, when somebody is uh, arguing and you're making, as a defense attorney, you're making your motion and limiting. Um, limiting the testimony of non-expert law enforcement witnesses. Opinion. Opinion becomes a huge part of motion and limine or limiting the prosecutors from being allowed to elicit opinion testimony from the arresting offer, officer, from the DUI officers, from their witnesses, because they're not experts unless they meet certain qualifications. But that's that's a different uh, story.
But in general, any expert, any officer, excuse me, arresting officer in a DUI trial that you're going to be dealing with is not an expert. So they should not be allowed uh, to give opinion testimony. All right. Um, Adam and my colleagues talked before about the fact that they're not allowed to be called tests. Um, so if that's something that um, you're worried about, then you can definitely throw that in there. That's not, you know, so much of a boilerplate um, motion saying no hearsay is allowed in this case. Um, it's, uh, it's a little bit, you know, standard, um, but ultimate goal is to include facts of your case after you put that blanket or boilerplate um, uh, recitation of what the evidence code is in the first place, okay? So keeping out, uh, we talked about precluding officers from rendering an opinion um, and keeping out privileged or hearsay statements, extremely, extremely important, okay? As we talked about earlier, my colleagues talked about the accident report privilege. Um, one of a, a trial that I had that was uh, one of my, I consider my, my biggest victories was because of what I was able to do during motion and eliminate practice. Um, it was keeping out um, the hearsay of the label, the actual label, the officer, it was a urine case involving um, prescription medication and the officer held up the pill bottle to the camera. Um, we argued that that was hearsay, okay? Um, the writing on the pill bottle, not the pill bottle itself. Uh, we presented always, always, always have to have the case law in your favor. We presented that to the judge and that label on the pill bottle was taken out and it, it set up our theory of defense uh, beautifully. Okay. 911 calls, of course, um, you want to be prepared through motion and lemonades to address any issues regarding 911 calls. Um, as well as, and I have this underlined in bold here because in a DUI trial, the most most common and the most time intensive aspect of motion and limine practice is redacting the DUI videos, assuming the DUI videos exist. So the roadside videos, um, dash cam videos, any body worn camera videos, um, there is those videos are very very often filled uh, with hearsay or filled uh, with prejudicial or irrelevant um, information. And redactions are crucial, and we're gonna go back to redactions um, because there's that important. Limiting the prosecutor's argument um, with supporting case law uh, is very important. Again, all based around what your theory is, what you want to limit, some things you might not want to limit, depending on what your theory is, um, and then you know, last on this slide, keeping out unfavorable state experts and what we refer to as DUI trial lawyers as junk science. Um, and one common example I provide here is retrograde extrapolation um, because there's just a ton, a ton of material to work on with retrograde extrapolation. Um, that will be a matter uh, for another time. Of course, you can reach out to us to discuss at any time if you have a case involving retrograde extrapolation, then uh, we can we can walk you through it, give you examples uh, of motions that we've filed as well. Okay. Some of the other common motion uh, grounds uh, in involve bolstering. Okay, again, knowing your rules of evidence, I suggest having a trial binder, um, having a booklet with all of the rules of evidence printed out. I, every trial I do, I still bring this book and I should have included it in here, but it's a book you can get on Amazon and it is a small uh, binded manual that has all of the uh, primary criminal evidence objections. Um, and it's always good to have on you as a reference, okay? Um, improper bolstering. We don't want these prosecutors being able to go up there and saying, my officer, uh, my star witness has done 20,000 DUI arrests, um, and therefore the jury should consider that when determining his credibility and the grounds uh, for his arrest here and whether we can prove our case. That's a no-no, okay? Make sure you have 
your uh, case law prepared. Uh, the case law is in the motion in limine and provided to the judge. Okay, burden shifting um, is a big one in motions in limine. Um, what was the defendant hiding? An innocent man would have taken the test. Now, there's case law, and it's something that what we call refusal cases, when people refuse to give roadsides, refuse to give breath, blood, urine, etc. Unfortunately, the, the prosecutors are allowed to argue for this concept of consciousness of guilt, but there is a very fine line uh, for you to work on through your practice and your research between consciousness of guilt and burden shifting. It's different to say, um, the pro prosecutor commenting on uh, an accused to submit a breath test is consciousness of guilt. It is an entirely different thing to say that because our client, because Mr. Jones refused a uh, breath test, he was hiding something or that an innocent person would have given a test, would have done the road signs. That's a no-no, okay? That's burden shifting. And why is that burden shifting? And this is gonna be something that, that can be pervasive and come up many times throughout the trial, not just motion and limine. It's burden shifting because it is placing the burden on the defense to have to present to the jury panel, to the jury, why our client, um, even if being innocent, did not provide um, a, a sample, okay? And we have no burden to prove or disprove anything, okay? We're gonna talk a bit more about refusal cases later and ways to get around uh, this consciousness of, of guilt uh, topic. But certainly in motion and limines, you can start off with uh, limiting them uh, and their ability to burden shift, okay? Um, the last one we have here, hiding evidence from the jury because he refused to submit a, a breath test. Again, uh, burden shifting, okay? Um, and just, just to hammer it, really hammer it home, okay? Um, we're going to go to some practice tips that I have here. Uh, I'm not going to get to redactions just yet, um, but the second point I have here, being very specific about your motion and eliminate, eliminate about what you are attempting to keep out. Okay, we do not want the judge just giving it a cursory look and saying, thank you, but I know the law, we're all good here. Okay, and that's what happens with boilerplate uh, motions and limine. We want to say, judge, you should not allow, uh, as an example, you, uh, our motion is to preclude any testimony um, regarding my client's potential prior bad acts. Now, that's a standard rule of evidence. And if you stop right there, the judge is going to say, you know, don't kind of disrespect me. I know how, I know that they can't talk about prior bad acts and they're officers of the court. They're not going to let them. So this is, this is really not appropriate. Your client's going to say, come on, man, how much preparation did you do? But if you say, um, judge, we don't want any prior bad acts being mentioned and here's why. At 42.23 minutes into the roadside video or into the body cam, my client is heard telling the officer that she has a prior DUI. And you break it down for them and you say, that is what I want kept out. And judges really, really appreciate and you build so much credibility when you essentially do their jobs for them. Less work for the judge, more credibility for you. So they can say, great, I agree with that. I agree with the law of prior bad acts and state here, you better make sure that doesn't happen or we're looking at a mistrial, okay? Now, ultimate, ultimate goal, okay? Have your proposed redactions, practice tip wise, have your proposed redactions of DUI videos timestamped time well in advance of trial, okay? Time stamped to the T because you wanna go into that motion and limine. And most common use, as I mentioned, of motion and limines in DUI trials is saying, 
we are trying to keep out a certain amount of information because it's irrelevant it's, or it's prejudicial um, or it violates hearsay or another rule of evidence. If you can say to the judge, judge, I am trying uh, to keep out the minute 42-23 minutes, uh, and 40, 42 minutes and 23 seconds of the roadside videos to 44 minutes because during that time period, my client um, talks about um, anything uh, improper hearsay, prejudicial, irrelevant. Then the judge can say, okay, state, um, I find that that would be irrelevant and prejudicial, so let's make our redactions, okay? We're about to take a break. The last couple things I want to say here is try and about motions and eliminate. Try and have your motions and eliminate heard as early as possible. It depends on the county you're in, and it depends on the judge. So you have to know what the judge. Um, you have to do your research, talk to colleagues, um, at least go on the clerk, pull up some other DUI trials uh, and some transcripts from this judge, and see uh, if people have been successful having your motion and liminees heard prior um, to the morning of trial. Why? Because we want to make these DUI redactions with enough, far enough in advance that we can watch the DUI redaction videos. Um, we don't want to just trust the state's IT department. Um, we want to make these redactions in advance so that we can then prepare accordingly about how we're going to defend our client. If through our motion in limine, we get um, the, the pill bottle, okay, or we get um, a cup of alcohol that was found, which we recently did, a cup of alcohol that was found um, in the client's car because it was overly prejudicial, a video of it redacted from the video, then we have, you know, if that's as it relates to our theory of defense, everything relating to that, and we have already issued the state a massive blow in their ability to prove their case. They might come, if we can be successful with these, as we have on many occasions, they might find, they might come back to us with saying, you know what, we don't think we can prove our case beyond a reasonable doubt. Will your client accept uh, a breakdown, a withhold to a reckless or a careless driving? So motion and eliminates are not just these boilerplate things that you have to file. Um, they can be very, very important. Okay. Um, last note before we take a five-minute break, motions and eliminate are crucial for preserving the record on appeal. A lot of what we do in trial, which we're not going to get into so much here um, about objecting and why we object uh, or, or not object, um, most you want to make sure that the judge announces each and every one of her rulings on the record regarding your motion and eliminate, each point of your motion and eliminate. And if you don't like the ruling, if it's not in your favor, you want to have on the record, judge, I object to your ruling on the motion and eliminate, you preserve um, the record that way. And then throughout the trial, even if the judge does rule in your favor, you still, you still want to object if the prosecutors attempt to still get this evidence in, it's not a blanket um, blanket objection throughout the trial. You have to raise it continuously throughout. So don't not object to something that is clearly objectionable just because the judge already said during motion and eliminate that they can't do it. Okay. All right. So next we're getting to jury selection, also known as what dear. Okay. I know people say it differently, what dire, what dear, but if you want to say it the classy French way. And how I think it should be said, how I say it, maybe I'm wrong, I say voir dire. Okay. Uh, so voir dire, jury selection, and if you're not comfortable with the pronunciation, especially with the first DUI trial, um, go ahead and just call it jury selection. Um, jury selection in a DUI case uh, is, is very complex because um, you don't have many charges like DUI um, that have such polarizing views. Um, that you're going to hear from the jury panel and about people in general. Uh, I think you, most people, you know, when, when our firm, when we're trying uh, homicide cases or uh, sexual uh, crime cases, most people are going to say, yeah, murder is bad, um, rape is bad, and uh, things along those lines. But you get very, very interesting, um, very, very interesting views 
on on blood on on DUI. Okay, um, you want to be prepared for your jury selection. Okay, but of all of all the different aspects of a DUI trial, you also have to be the most flexible. Wadir does very often does not go how you think it's going to go because it depends on the panel of potential jurors that you have in front of you. Okay, so you have to be flexible. It does take a lot of practice. Jury selection is an art. Don't be too hard on yourself. Um, most importantly, as I say here, jury selection uh, is really the first time that you get to start planting the seeds um, of your case. Okay. So preparing for voir dire, right? Step one, based on your theory of defense, based on what you're going to be presenting uh, throughout your themes and your theories, who do you want on your jury and who do you not want on your jury? Um, I have this quote here from Mick Jagger, it's from a famous song, you can't always get what you want, which is true during jury selection, but if you try sometimes, you might actually get what you need. Okay, and that kind of goes into our next concept, which is jury selection versus jury deselection in DUI case. Okay, who do I want versus who do I not want and why? General, general consensus, I would say, among the you know, DUI trial attorneys and, and trial, DUI defense attorneys or criminal defense attorneys in general is that jury selection is a process um, of actually jury deselection, okay? It is about getting, fundamentally, jury selection is about finding creative ways to elicit the truth, to elicit biases from potential jurors and to elicit the truth so that you can decide who would not be favorable to your defense and potentially get them uh, with a cause challenge. Okay, but that's very nuanced. Again, I think Wadir personally could be a entire CLE by itself and a very long one, but I'm gonna try and break it down to you, especially in DUI cases, as much as possible. I mentioned before that uh, with DUI, unlike other crimes, you're gonna get a very, very interesting uh, and very different feelings uh, about how um, people feel about drinking and driving. Okay, uh, so you want to find individuals who would be favorable to your theory of defense, okay, but you have to expect, too, that the prosecution, uh, if they're favorable to our theory or it appears favorable, they are probably going to use a peremptory challenge on them. They're going to be able to get them off, usually, um, for the really favorable people, but there are ways to use, there are ways to start planting your theory of defense and your themes in voir dire and jury selection um, that uh, even if those people are gonna be gone, the other panel, the rest of the veneer we call them, the rest of the panel, they've heard it. And once they've heard it, um, it's there, okay? And there's some different strategic ways to go about doing that, okay? Um, Wadir, if you're interested in French, means to speak the truth. Wadir is about truth, and there are a lot of very, um, very nuanced and, and skilled ways that you can get truth out of people without appearing um, as if you're cross-examining them or badgering them. Uh, that's the prosecutor's job, okay, not ours. All right, so I have here, you never get a second chance to make a great first impression. Uh, very true. A lot of voir dire, it's the first time that they're hearing from the defense attorney, um, and you want to be endearing to, uh, to the, um, the panel. You want to be sociable. You want to be confident. You want to throw in some jokes. Um, now, of course, this, if this is your first DUI trial, uh, it's the UI of Audier is usually the most nervous uh, part of it because you haven't had to practice with it before. Um, but, you know, I went to, uh, uh, I, I do federal work and I went to a um, advanced federal CLE once and speaking to one of the judges, one of the uh, top judges in the Southern District of Florida, 
And in federal law, you don't get voir dire. You get to submit questions and maybe, maybe um, you get about 10 minutes at most to question the juries at all. Um, and this judge said something that was very, he's a very, very renowned judge um, in federal court in Miami. And he said, the purpose of voir dire is establishing credibility, is being likable, is having conversation with them. So we don't need to give you an hour, whatever it may be in state court. Um, because at the end of the day, you want to, of course, get, get, pick the right jury, but also endear yourselves to the jury. Um, so that takes practice, that takes time, confidence, throwing out jokes, knowing how to communicate with people, um, small tips regarding that, do your best to learn each juror's name, okay? Um, so that you don't have to look at your page every time uh, you are going to look to find the juror to speak to a specific potential juror. Um, learn their names quickly, whatever, you can use different, different ways of doing that, um, but it helps a lot in being endearing to them because the prosecutors very rarely, um, especially at the DUI level, they're not going to. They're going to look at their uh, ad and they're going to say juror number in your name was, or they're going to mispronounce the name. Start off on a great, great foot. Make a great first impression um, with the jurors. Okay. Um, forward. Okay. Going back, to actually, for a second, I want to hit on another point. The state's voir dire, again, this goes back to what I said before. Their voir dire is in DUI cases. Um, is going to be very cookie cutter. They're going to repeat what the judge said. And like I say in the slide, we go third. We have to use that to our benefit. Okay. We have heard already the judge has done his voir dire uh, and his questionnaire to the jurors. Um, the state has gone um, and the state mostly just repeats uh, standard questions that the judge asks and does follow up. Doesn't help us a lot. Um, and then we go into our voir dire and it gives us an opportunity um, to really to really show our confidence in our skill. OK, um, and then no wasted time, no wasted questions. And we'll talk a bit, a bit about a bit more about that as well. OK, so some of the things on this slide, I'll go through this um, pretty briefly, um, but the law does, in fact, under a case called Lovato versus State, um, to allow you to test your defense on the panel. Now, it has to be done in the right way uh, so as to avoid this very common objection of pre-trying. We'll talk about that a bit more um, in a future slide. But the ultimate, ultimate goal of Wadir um, is to test your theory of defense, find individuals who will not um, uh, uh, consider or who are not in favor of your theory of defense. Um, maybe that's because of their profession. Okay. In certain cases, uh, you have to think about, oh, I have a breath case, um, but the numbers are off. Uh, we are one of our theory of defense is that um, there were discrepancies in the machines. So a mathematician, um, people who deal with numbers, engineers, are, are very often fantastic for that, depending on uh, what kind of um, leaders they are, okay, and their personality. You have to get people opening up and you have to talk to them and that takes a lot of practice, okay? So if your theory of defense is um, that drinking and driving by itself is not illegal, okay, um, which is really one of the two, Vaudeer, can, you can get very creative. Test different hypotheticals out. Um, try as many cases as you can. That's really the only way to get good at voir dire. Um, but especially, especially uh, when it comes to the fundamentals of voir dire, two things that in almost any jury selection you're really going to want to hit on in a DUI trial are negative feelings about alcohol, okay, and also feelings about drinking and driving. Right. Um, video evidence, if there's video evidence, is very important to what you're on. Um, for example, if the state presented witnesses who said Mr. Jones was driving while intoxicated, but you saw a videotape 
taken shortly after the stop and he appeared, Mr. Jones appeared to you to be sober. Okay. Are you going to take the officer's word because they are DUI task force officers potentially, or can you make your own um, determination of whether somebody is, um, appears that their normal faculties are, are impaired or not, or that they appear drunk and unsafe to operate a motor vehicle. Um, I always, I always like to ask questions along the lines of, do you think, uh, do any jurors feel that drinking and driving, you know, flat out should be illegal? If so, why? Okay. And you'll see it in, in this slide that I underline and bold the why. Okay. You always want to follow up with why. If you're speaking as the defense attorney during voir dire, even close to as much uh, as the, um, the panel members are speaking, the potential jurors, you're not doing an effective voir dire. It's about getting them to talk and then listening. Okay, there are different tactics you can use as well, depending on their responses. And as you're testing your theory of defense with them, um, but it's, you should never, never be talking. Our job is not to educate them on the law. That's what prosecutors do. That's what um, judges do during their voir dire. And we have to be cognizant of that. Okay. If our theory of defense involves a specific area of law and the judge left a certain part out of their questionnaire, that would have really helped us in not having to waste our limited time during voir dire. That would be great, but if not, there are situations where you have to get to some of the more basic concepts. But in general, you are looking for people who are not favorable for our theory of defense. Okay, voir dire in refusal cases versus voir dire in breath cases. Okay, um, you have to tailor your voir dire to your theory of defense. Um, in refusal cases, I'm always, always asking to get the jurors talking. Um, I try not to do uh, raising hands as much as possible. What are some reasons why an innocent person um, or a sober person right, would refuse to take an intoxilizer test? Would you, uh, juror, whatever, Miss, Miss Jones, would you refuse if you had one drink? What about two drinks? What would be the deciding factor for you and why? Always follow up with why. If we don't ask that why, we're not getting to the heart of the issue. We're not achieving our ultimate goals of Wadir in a DUI defense, okay? But again, everything has to be tailored to our theory of defense. Refusal cases, trusting machines, getting fed up with law enforcement. If our theory of defense is that our client uh, was just fed up, he knew he was going to jail for whatever reason anyways, then we wanna ask, we wanna start planting that seed and ask, the jury panel about that. Um, do you trust machines? How do you feel about machines? Um, if you were no, go, if you knew you were going to jail no matter what, would you give a breath sample? Okay, if you had to spend the night regardless, even if you blew zeros, you're still spending the night. These are in refusal cases, questions that are essential, but you can model them uh, however, however you would like. So, one hypothetical that I always like to use, and there's a lot of different ways that I've played around with it because I love Wadir, it's a great way to get creative, is this hypothetical regarding uh, metal detectors, okay? So I've, I've played around with it and I'll ask in different ways. One way that I'll commonly ask uh, and start off is saying, everybody here has been through a metal detector, right? Everybody says yes, of course, okay. Um, has anybody uh, in the panel ever been certain that they had no metal on their person, they're going to the airport and they're going through the machine, certain they had no metal on them, but the alarm still went off, right? And, and I, if, if you have a talkative jury, right, you have to know you and, and be aware of the panel that you have. If you have a talkative jury, um, then this is a, a very successful hypothetical. Um, and you'll say, yeah, how did you feel when you went through? Um, was it an issue for you? No, it wasn't an issue, um, Mr. Terrace, because I just went back and uh, went back through. Maybe there was an issue with the machine, a discrepancy, but I walked through that machine with no, with no worries because I knew I had no metal on me. And I'll ask them, so, Ms. Jones, um, what if in a different world there was a law 
the world we lived in I had a law that said if you go into an airport with metal okay if you go through a metal detector and that metal detector goes off then that can be a crime or that can be used as evidence of a crime against you knowing right you told me before 100 percent certain that you had no metal on you and you still walk through would you still walk through that metal detector okay and majority of the answers that i've gotten when i presented it eloquently and tactfully and properly is yeah no i wouldn't go i would turn around okay and that helps set this stage this theme of a lack of trust in machines which is almost always almost always the primary grounds of our defense for overcoming the consciousness of guilt is lack of trust in machines okay so i love that hypothetical regarding metal detectors it can be used in different ways and just get super creative okay i have some general practice tips um, here that i'm going to skip through um, for the time being um, given the uh, given that there's a lot of writing but there's law included in there um, but most important takeaway of this tip regarding this pre-trying is just make sure you bring with you case law regarding this concept of pre-trying. Pre-trying is essentially when you are presenting the facts of your case and asking the jurors to consider those facts or the potential jurors to consider those facts and reach a verdict. Prosecutors say pre-try, pre-try, pre-try. They object all day um, during, during your voir dire. Uh, and you have to be prepared for that with case law saying, no, what I'm, not, what I'm asking is not pre-trying. I have a right under the case law to um, question the panel on whether or not they can follow my theory of defense and whether or not they can believe in my theory of defense. That is not pre-trying. We're not asking them to commit to a verdict. So you'll have these slides and you can read through it a bit more specifically, okay? Um, the standard law enforcement credibility becomes huge part of Wadir um, if it, it, it is uh, in accordance with your theory of defense. So don't think that it only has to be these super creative topics, um, bad DUI investigations, client not testifying. If it supports your theory of defense, then absolutely go for it, okay? These are important concepts. Concepts, hopefully the judge has, the judge or the prosecutor has handled most of them and all you'll be doing is following up and trying to build cause challenges on jurors who provided very bad answers um, or a lack of understanding to those theories. Okay, now into cross-examination. Okay, uh, cross-examination, a couple of quotes here that are su super important. Uh, failing to prepare, preparation is everything in cross-examination. By preparing, failing to prepare, you're preparing to fail, okay? Um, it's all about preparation, especially in DUI trials when you are dealing with these DUI task force, the DUI officers whose sole job is to make DUI arrests and come show up at trial and prove uh, provide testimony to support the state that somebody uh, is, uh, is guilty of DUI, have to make sure that you have control over that. And I provide slides on how to do that, okay? Um, a quote here talking about the importance of DUI trial, cross-examination fundamentals, okay? If prepared correctly, you're your cross-examination, you're going to know all of the answers uh, before you even ask them, okay? Um, it's going to be tied to your theory of defense, and you're going to be prepared uh, for closing argument. Everything is going to come into a perfect picture because it's all, um, all preordained. We ask questions that we know we're going to get answers to, um, and there are strategies to do this. I include one of my favorite movie, Training Day. Cross-examination is checked. Chess, not checkers. Okay, all these different things that you can use, take a look at them to prepare for your cross-examination. Mehdi talked about these when you're preparing cases generally, um, when you're preparing cross-examination. Organizing effective cross chapter method, breaking down your cross into specific chapters. 
uh, is very, very favorable, especially when you don't have these years of skills and many, many uh, DUI trial experiences um, and, uh, and having a planned out um, chapter by chapter um, approach can be very, very helpful, okay? Um, obviously, primacy and, re and recency, always very important com concepts um, when uh, choosing which chapters to go with. Um, another just side point practice tip, when you're moving from one chapter of cross, whether it's roadsides to the arrest itself, always give a statement to the jury saying, we're now, or to the witness, but also for the jury sitting there to hear, we're now going to be moving on to this. Okay, it helps tie in everything with the theory of defense, and you're helping the, the jurors follow along in your cross-examination, which can be very, uh, very te uh, burdensome and tedious. Okay, I provide here, uh, provide you with some general rules uh, for each chapter of cross, main points, leading questions only, right? These are the ways that you control your witness. Um, this is tried and true, no, no ifs, ands, or buts. One fact per question, okay, um, as you ask them, uh, because you are building towards an ultimate conclusion, okay, and you're reinforcing your theory of defense throughout the entire process. Short questions, um, questions that are too long, compound, you're going to get compound answers from the witness, and the judge is going to say, well, you asked the compound question, so I'm going to let this witness uh, just go off the rails, okay? And for young attorneys who are trying their first DUI, you have to be able to control what you can control, and that's short questions, straight to the point, controlling your witness to the best of your ability, okay? There are some other practice tips in here. Time's getting a bit short, but you can read all these, and you can always contact me about any questions that you might have, okay? There's some additional tips here. Always be on the lookout for officer bias. Um, if if uh, the officer is considers himself, if he appears very pompous, then build him up to break him down, okay? That's what I'm always telling people um, when we're talking about cross. Build the officer up, say, oh, and you have all this training, and you've had all this experience, and you've made thousands of DUI arrests. These are all things that you might learn from deposition, as we talked about earlier formal review, depending on the judge and the jury, things along those lines. Um, build them up and say, you're so great, but Officer Jones, um, isn't it true that you missed uh, completely this aspect of your cross-examination here? You only considered um, the clues of the uh, cues on the roadsides that the client missed. Um, you didn't mention anything about what he did well, correct? Isn't it your job? Isn't the kind of law enforcement that we want uh, in society, not only looking to uh, gather evidence of guilt, but also of innocence. And that's how it should be. Um, but we have to be prepared in DUI trials that especially these DUI so-called task force or expert individuals um, are not going to uh, give us uh, much leeway there and we have to control it, okay? When we're talking about DUI cross-examination tips, it's your choice how you want to go in chronological order and breaking down your case. Um, common ones, officer's lack of training and knowledge, driving pattern, post-stop pre-arrest observation, FSEs, post-arrest con post -arrest conduct, and then breath test procedure and refusal. Um, I do a couple cautionary notes down here that you can um, take a look at and feel free to call me about with any questions. Um, always rely on the NISTA guidelines as Adam and, and my rest of my partners discussed before. Be prepared for these. Um, be prepared to use them against the officers in cross-examination. Okay. More tactics, um, common themes that we use, um, challenging their qualifications, um, highlighting the factors as Adam talked before that when we're talking about roadsides that it's an officer asking to do, have somebody do abnormal exercises um, to test normal faculties. Officer, um, do you normally walk down the road heel to toe? If you saw somebody on the street, wouldn't that appear strange to you? They can't deny that. Um, when you see somebody uh, standing at a bus stop, 
Um, it would it be odd to you if they were standing on one leg? Yes, it would. That would be abnormal. So why are we doing it here, right? And obviously putting it into a package one question at a time, but those are the common themes, okay? Continuing about roadsides, um, feel free to take a look at this. Um, divided attention, very important. These roadside exercises have mental aspects as well as physical aspects, okay? Um, you want to highlight the mental. Uh, if the video doesn't look so good, um, if the video looks good, then you absolutely want to highlight the fact that the officer's reports um, and you want to cross them on the fact that their reports do not match up with what the jurors are going to see on the video. And very often, if done properly, you can get the officer himself to admit um, that he um, would agree that the best evidence in a case is the videos, okay? And that's important if your theory of defense is videos over officer testimony, okay? I have here common chapters. You can look through Again, uh, refusal cases, right? It all starts from your theory of defense, starts from voir dire. Um, so be careful with that. Make sure everything is stuck to your theory of defense. Um, lack, of, lack of evidence, uh, no per se evidence of DUI, no breath results. Um, definitely in refusal cases, you have the most ability to really tear down these officers as opposed to machines and experts, okay? Um, continuing just on some of the most common goals, uh, refusals in cross-examination cases. Um, in these cases, you know, everything has to be global to the theory of defense. We're not going to have time to talk about much blood and urine cases here, um, but uh, it gets a bit more complex. This is your first DUI, so unlikely that you'll be doing it alone um, with someone who hasn't had some experience um, with blood or urine, okay? Refusal cases, again, step one, start building that theory of defense. Then more examples, crosses and refusal cases, very common examples, which are also uh, potentially service theories of defense or themes, okay, um, is what we hear in refusal. The goal being we have to give the jury a reason to think that the individual refused, okay, not because he thought it was going to be, uh, because he thought he was DUI, okay? And there's a list of 17 reasons right here that you can review. I'm not gonna read each one for time's sake, that you can review um, in, order to, in order to build your cross-examinations in these cases, all right? I'm gonna keep going here, just more information. Um, crossing on admissions is important. So just an example of a successful chapter here that you can review um, as far as normal faculties go. You don't, Officer Jones, you don't know how my client normally sees, normally hears, normally talks, judge distances, drive a cars, and each one of these can be their own chapter. Um, but all we're working towards here as far as a conclusion is Officer Jones cannot sufficiently, this is the conclusion of your chapter, Officer Jones cannot sufficiently testify that my client's normal faculties were impaired because you've essentially led him into a trap. And he's saying, no, I cannot, no, I cannot, no, I cannot. How does that relate then to your theory of defense? Because Officer Jones jumped the gun and failed to gather sufficient evidence of impairment, the state now lacks the evidence to prove that my client was DUI beyond and to the exclusion of all reasonable doubt. So this is the purpose of the chapter method we're building to ultimate conclusions to later be able to use in cross-examination. A cross and refusals continued. Feel free to read this and ask any questions. It's all very great information. We're just getting short on time and I'm a trial attorney and I love to talk. Okay, breath cases. Adam covered most of breath cases, all right? Just some things to do here. They can be beat, all right? They're not, it's not the end all be all different ways here. Um, a lot of it is about whether they followed FDLE requirements. A lot of it is about whether or not the breath sample was caught on camera. In some counties it will be, other counties it won't be, um, but this is an example, uh, 
essentially a checklist of things you should be doing um, to see if the officers in your case, hopefully you can get it through depositions, if not depositions and through a formal review hearing um, or other forms of discovery to see if they were actually following procedure. Okay, because a, a not following procedure um, means that uh, uh, the roads are the breath, breath test, the breath machine, excuse me, uh, is not valid. Okay, there are set procedures for this and it has to be followed. Another thing that Adam mentioned is the fact that no, this is a hidden black box that nobody gets into. Jurors um, resonate. Uh, that concept resonates with jurors. So consider that as well. Wadir, super critical to, um, to beating a, a breath case. Who do we want? Do we want people who are technologically savvy, depending on your theory of defense, not technologically savvy? Um, do uh, in, uh, jurors um, uh, have an inherent belief in machines? Do they trust machines? Do they machine feel machines can be faulty? Things along those lines that you would want to voir dire on with them in order to pick your jury, okay? Again, specific examples that you can use here um, to talk uh, to, for your voir dire. Um, you can read through this and just use them, take them straight from it. Um, to go over um, the best ways to build your theory of defense, to cross the voir dire and breath cases, okay? Um, always try and have jurors say not guilty, okay? Helps, different ways you can do that. And I'm just waiting for the slide to load. Cross-examination ta um, tactics and breath cases. Feel free to re uh, review this, it's technical. I mentioned the source code dilemma, use the codes. Again, we're getting, getting, wish I had more time because I love talking about this stuff. We're going to go through judgment of acquittal quickly, okay? So judgment of acquittal um, is based on rule 3.380, motion for judgment of acquittal, pur purpose of a motion for judgment of acquittal, challenge legal sufficiency of the evidence at trial court. It comes on two occasions. You make your first judgment of acquittal, um, when, when the prosecution rests their case, and you'll see here on the slide, I actually have it written out and you can use this um, uh, as far as insert argument, okay? You can use it, I advise for your first DUI trial, and I still do it, I write out my judgment of acquittals. Um, one other note regarding judgment of acquittal, of course, if we win the judgment of acquittal, case goes away, we win. Um, boilerplate language, again, not a good idea for judgment of acquittal. You're not going to win on a boilerplate language judgment of acquittal. For your first JOA, you're going to say, viewing the evidence in the light most favorable to the non-moving party, the state, now that they've rested, the state has failed to make a prima facie case of whatever DUI charge it might be because, and then specific argument, specific testimony, um, and quotes as to why they fail to meet that standard, not just they fail to meet the standard. Okay, now going on to closing argument. Um, closing argument, again, feel free to review the slide. This is you know, the, the time that trial attorneys love more than anything, okay? Uh, it's the grand finale, but in a DUI case, um, it's really just, uh, using the control you now have, um, how all the evidence has presented, and just walking the uh, jury through why your theory of defense, okay, is the one that they should bring back, the one that, they, that should be resonating in their mind uh, during the case, okay? It's a great chance to peacock. Prosecutors' closing arguments and DUI trials are very boring. Um, get up there. Uh, it takes practice, okay, it takes confidence, using voice inflection, um, using movement around the room, eye contact, certain, certainly extremely important, not too much eye contact, but really you're using closing argument to reaffirm now that the jurors have, hear, have heard everything, going all the way back to voir dire and saying, being able to walk them through step by step how Ladies and gentlemen, I told you, we talked about in voir dire about why somebody would refuse. You talked about in voir dire about why somebody would refuse. Now you've seen the evidence and you can see 
why in this case, Mr. Jones refused, okay? And they think, wow, yeah, we did talk about that in voir dire. And after cross-examination, uh, it actually did turn out that now we're at a point um, where the things we talked about in voir dire, those more general concepts, it makes sense now, right? It's a cohesive, a cohesive uh, way to close out your case in the strongest way possi possible. I start thinking personally about closing argument the same, same time I start thinking about my theory of defense. From the very, very first time I get my hands on a police report in a meeting with the client. So that's just a bit more about what I talked about, keeping everything cohesive. Some more tips regarding closing argument. Really, really try not to read directly from a piece of paper. Um, it's not endearing to a jury. Um, it's uh, very important that you memorize as much as possible or refer to, um, refer to some bullet points or notes, okay? Look the jurors in the eye, pace your delivery, moderate your tone, show the juries that you, show the jury that you understand and you can more clearly and confidently present the facts of the case to them than the prosecutor is able to do. Also anticipate that the jurors, uh, we go second. So the prosecutors are going to have a chance to do a rebuttal closing and be prepared for that. And say it, say it genuinely and accept the bad parts of the evidence that they saw, but take the wind out of it, take the wind out of the prosecutor's sail when they get to the point of their final closing because they do get the last word. Okay, again, closing tips and tricks. Visual aids are fantastic. I love replaying the roadside video with um, a, a projection screen um, with help from my co-counsel or myself. You have to make sure the technology is set up and during closing argument, walking them through the roadside videos, if the way our client looked on the roadside video is our strongest theory of defense or our theme and our theory, um, making sure uh, that they can see the video again and show them piece by piece on the video um, where our theory of defense can be found and where they can see it, okay? Now, this is the last thing I'm gonna talk about. I know I'm over my time, but I cannot stress, it might sound silly, I cannot stress how important this is. You have to, you have to consider how you present yourself from a physical standpoint, okay? With, for men, with your suits, for women, uh, with your dress, um, your suits as well. Um, jurors are not only judging you, okay? This is especially true when you're a public defender. Um, you want to look uh, like you're not one, okay? I'm just gonna say it as simply as that. Um, no one, you do not have to go buy an Italian custom suit, okay? But you have to have your shirt tucked in, have your tie pulled up, okay? Wear decent shoes, okay? Jurors are looking at these things. They're human beings. And as much as they've sworn to abide by the law, um, they're still going to have these things in the back of their mind that they're looking at, okay? Um, men uh, and women, make sure you're groomed, uh, shave or trim your beard uh, beforehand for men, um, and just present yourself as your client deserves to be presented. Have your suits tailored, okay? It can make an incredible incredible amount of difference. It shows your confidence, it shows you believe in your case, and it, in that you believe in your clients, okay? No one is saying you have to go and spend a million dollars. There are ways you can call me. I've actually given presentations at the Palm Beach County Public Defender on how public defenders can dress appropriately um, and cheap, cheap or affordable ways to still come off very presentable, okay? Um, have, get a haircut. Give your client what they deserve. It's not shallow. Um, the best, the best attorneys I have seen it time and time again. The way they present themselves, the way they look, it can truly, truly hurt their case. And I cannot stress that enough. Lastly, I would encourage you all um, to read this, these ten rules uh, by the late great. Kobe Bryant, because they have so much applicability um, to DUI trial defense, okay? Get better every single day. 
work on your weaknesses. Be proud of a loss. Be proud that you tried a case. Don't, don't be upset. Yeah, losses are upsetting. There's no question. Okay, but be, be proud of the experience you gained. Execute what you practice. Learn from greatness. Talk to colleagues. Know your judge. Know what they like. Know, much, know how much time they give for voir dire. Um, learn, learn from other people who have come before you. So important for a first-time DUI trial attorney. Learn from wins and losses. Be ambitious. Believe in yourself. Believe in your team. And learn storytelling because storytelling just is just another word uh, for, for theme and your theory of defense. That is throughout the entire entire presentation. Okay, so I know I had to rush through a bit. There's a lot of good material in there. I encourage you all to take a look at it. Um, and if you have any questions um, about anything that I was not able to cover in the slides, um, then I would be more than happy, my partners would be more than happy to speak with all of you, okay? We all, myself, Manny, Adam, and Mehdi, very, very much appreciated your time. Uh, and please, please do not hesitate to get in contact with us. We can answer all of your questions.